Uh, good morning, everybody. Morning. Um, thank you very much for coming to the FISA Coaches Conference. Uh, and I'd just like to um, take a few minutes to just think about um, what's going to happen over the next couple of days. So first of all, um, my name is Rosie McLaughlin and uh, I am the chair of the Competitive Commission and I'm also on the FISA Executive. And I would like to introduce to you my team on, my com on the Competitive Commission who will be very active and involved in running this conference with me. Uh, so there's Johan Flodin from Norway, yep. um, Ma Marcello Varial from Brazil, Mario Voltz from Germany, Peter Cookson from Canada, Faisal Sula from Tunisia, uh, Nabojša Ilic from Serbia and Turkey, and then we have uh, Henk Janswala and uh, Pascal Bouton will join us uh, later today. And it wouldn't be complete if I didn't also um, acknowledge the director of coaching, Gianni Postiglioni, who's from multiple countries, and most of you will know him. So the, sub the title for this conference is Managing Your Environment to Maximize Performance. And um, one of the things that we had some conversations about yesterday, because we had a pre-session with some of our coach educators, was talking about how athletes have changed. And then probably that means that as coaches, we also need to change. And there are things now that uh, perhaps a few years ago would have been acceptable, that would not be acceptable, or might be challenged by by our athletes in a way that they wouldn't have been in the past. And so um, we have the title, Managing Your Environment to Maximize Performance. And within this session, within the, the two days, uh, we've got quite a lot around, first of all, our wonderful coaches in the spotlight who really are prepared to open up and share their programs and their methodologies, et cetera, with us. But then we have uh, some things around uh, culture, uh, mental well-being for athletes. We also have uh, Jean Cote, who is going to talk a bit about um, the how of coaching rather than the what of coaching, which is also, um, is also important uh, for us as coaches. Um, and then this afternoon, we have a panel discussion about culture in development, in, uh, culture development in elite performance sport. Um, finally, this afternoon, we have a session on coastal rowing uh, on beach sprints. Um, we've just recently had the first ever world event, world rowing event in uh, Saint-Jean in China. And um, I think increasingly, people are being exposed to the beach sprints. And so therefore, it's probably a good idea that you understand it a little bit better so we've, uh, we have four people who are going to talk about it. So Gwyn Batten, who's the chair of that commission uh, that manages the, the uh, beach coastal rowing. Um, and then we also have a physiologist who's going to talk about the event and the requirements for the event. We have a coach who was at the, has coached at the event and then an athlete who's now competed in two of the events. Um, and that concludes today. Uh, but then tomorrow, um, we have got choices. So we, for most of the day, we have parallel sessions. And we would like you to make a choice about which session you're going to go to. And if at the break, you could go round to the desk, uh, but probably not all at once, um, then we can make sure that you, uh, we know how big the sessions are going to be and what size rooms we need to have available uh, to make sure that we can, we can manage those sessions properly. Um, and the first session of that is going to be FISA or um, how to create a Paralympic program in your, in your club and in your country. And um, I think Nick, we've got Nick Baker who's going to talk on that. And Nick has been a very successful coach with British rowing, but also very successful in developing rowers from zero to being performance rowers within a Paralympic setting. 
So I'm not going to say too much more, except that um, I recently read the biography of uh, Tommy Keller, who was, uh, who was the, the president of, uh, of FISA uh, up till the late 80s. And um, one of the things that he was extremely keen on and felt was important about the sport of rowing and really uh, managed, he had quite a big voice in global sport, not just in rowing. And one of the things that he talked about was about the healthy mind and the healthy body and how important sport was for young people and people of all ages. So he introduced masters rowing um, and various other things during his time within the Federation. And so I think um, that probably also emphasizes a little bit what our program is about over the next two days. So thank you for coming, um, and I'm sure that um, we, got, we will have great food for thought. So we'll move on to our first presentation. Thank you. Yes, welcome and thank you. Uh, good morning. Um, one of the key factors in developing of our sport has been sharing, and uh, I guess everybody in this room know the guy who was my mentor, and I think he is mentoring a lot of you, the, you other coaches as well, Tor Nielsen. He was extremely keen on sharing and still is. I'm going to give you the best from him. I had coffee with him two days ago. So sharing is a very important thing to develop our sport and I think the culture in rowing, as far as I know, has been really good at sharing. And we have had the pleasure this year to have two coaches who's going to share their experience. They're both born the same year. Uh, I don't want to say which, but they're going to be a big year next year. Uh, they're both successful former rowers and successful coaches, and they're both coaches a single scholar and a four at this year's World Championships. Uh, the first one is Lorraine, Lorraine Korholtz. Korholtz. She has uh, gold medals in the eight herself and a silver medal from the Olympics. Uh, she has several medals as a coach, and uh, this year she coached the bronze medalist in the women's singles color and coached four who made the Olympic qualification. Thomas Paulson, a former lightweighter, he still looks very fit. <coughs> uh, he was uh, a part of the fantastic lightweight four who won the Olympics in 1996 and uh, had consecutive gold medals after that. Uh, he, unfortunately, is a really good coaching scholar, single scholar as well. So we have a big battle going on. Uh, and I hope, I hope we have some success next year. So uh, please welcome Laurel and Thomas. There will be, uh, if we have time in this first block, there will be some questions. But there will also be a block of sec questions after their second block today. So warm welcome. Okay. Um, hello all, and thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, thank you also to FISA for inviting me to come speak to you all, um, as well as to Thomas Polson for joining me in this, um, uh, to examine this issue. Um, those of you who know me know that uh, I don't really speak a lot. Um, <laughs> I don't speak much on stage, um, but this is such a great opportunity uh, that I, and I am glad to be here. Um, well, does this work? Well, I also don't manage technology. Sorry? So just so you all know, 
every little YouTube video that I saw about giving a speech was like, don't start it with, this doesn't work. <laughs> so here I am, starting you all off with, this doesn't work. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right, technique and training. Here are the uh, topics I was asked to discuss, technique and training, and you'll be relieved to know that this will be the last slide I will read directly from the screen. Speedy and effectual. As I was organizing my thoughts, this quote kept popping into my mind, because that's the core mission isn't it? No matter what you take on technique and training, the point is to create speed effectively. We could likely have a very long discussion and many, many YouTube hours of watching racing video, um, analyzing different countries and how they row and what they do and who is rowing best and who does what. But this is a discussion that usually occurs over a bunch of beers and doesn't change minds, but just opens debate. I would like to discuss what is the purpose of technique? The purpose of technique is to create efficient speed. What is the goal of training? The, training, the goal of training is to enable athletes to retain their speed and efficiency over 2,000 meters. There are many challenges to arriving in the goal of speed and efficiency in our athletes. This quote is from an article written in the Pennsylvania Gazette in 1754 by its publisher, Benjamin Franklin. You might recognize the political cartoon that was published with it. Ben Franklin sought to unite the colonies against King George and Great Britain. Hopefully we have been forgiven. We are here now. Um, his article stressed the weakness and fallibility of disorganized forces. He wrote about the extreme difficulty in getting so many individual people and organizations to agree for the purpose of a speedy and effectual outcome. This analogy rings true in coaching. That's the interesting challenge before us. When everyone is in charge, no was in charge. That was Ben Franklin's point, and our challenge as coaches is the same. This look, we've all seen our athletes give us this look. I perfected my look when I was quite young. I don't wanna. <laughs> when it comes to trying new things, either as a program or as an individual, change is hard. We've all been at this, many of us athletes first, and all of us coaching as the world changes. This is going to sound like pretty much everyone who has ever coached for a long period of time, but it used to be more straightforward. It used to be just you and your athlete, and you were pretty much the only input into that athlete's um, career. My love of sport started with riding horses. That's me on Happy Rollover. His name was Happy Rollover because he liked to roll over. He would choose to get rid of me, stop, drop, and I would scramble out of the way. Um, that's my coach, Diane, with me still on Happy. Diane was kind and infinitely patient. I had one horse, one coach, and she did the best she could with her knowledge um, and experience. No less and no more, and that was that. This scenario defined, focused, insular, and invisible has phased out. It is no longer one voice and one thought. We have much, much more to work with now. We have technology, we have physical therapists, we have psychologists. All these must be amalgamated into 
what you are communicating to your athlete. The good comes with the more complicated and, uh, and challenging. This is me in college um, before I transferred to a bigger program. We won, we had a great time, but that was literally the only goal. There was nine months of rowing in the year. I rowed for six weeks, um, and that was it. You were done. These days, coaches have more than their own experience to inform them, as well as vastly improved technology. But another way of saying this is more opinions, which brings back Ben Franklin's point. It's hard for everyone to be in charge. It's less focused, and as he said, harder for all of us to agree. Technology is giving coaches ever-increasing data about all parts of the stroke. People, business, uh, sorry. Technology is giving us all parts of the stroke. But the path to success is not revealed by an algorithm. We are, no doubt, in the people business, not just the measuring business. <laughs> Athletes are more empowered to add their voice and unique perspectives, which sometimes makes them less receptive to direct us from their coaches. After all, the way they got there is the way they did their things. So why should they listen? I suspect there is a broad agreement that performance is improved with a broader base of knowledge. More knowledge brings better technique, better training. However, Ben Franklin was right. There is a loss of unified focus when one or more voice is providing input. One person can make decisions faster, make the goals crystal clear and unchanging, but it is limited by their singular breadth of knowledge and experience. Bringing the athletes a voice has uncountable benefits, not in least improving, improving their safety. But a national team isn't a consensus experiment. Training can make you stronger and technique can make you faster, but both require athletes to put their trust into their coaches. Um, some examples we've all likely seen. Making a technique change um, sometimes makes an athlete slower and they have to struggle through being slower before they will get faster. They learn to develop their strengths through change and eventually, with many, 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 many more strokes down the line, they will become faster. But in order to accept this change, they have to uh, put their strength, their trust in what you are telling them. Athletes follow the training regimen of their coaches, but as applied within their own experience. They know themselves and their bodies best, and elite sports as much as about developing their mental reserve as anything else. But their perspective is insular. It is only their own. The last challenge to discuss um, is the survey culture. It is the 800-pound gorilla in the room. We're all grappling. Um, we're all grappling with finding the balance in this new world. These ch changes echo across all fields. Everyone is learning how to understand the input um, of surveys. More opinions, more transparency, but also more interpretation. How do you define success? Not everyone has the same definition of goal. Athletes consumers, patients, their perspective is critical. This is, after all, the, at the end of the day, about making a boat go fast. But the survey al culture also leaves things like hospitals adding valet parking rather than more care providers. The patients want it, are happy with hospitals that park their cars, and unhappy with those that don't. Another example of defining success at the team level, our goals focus on worlds and ultimately, of course, the Olympics. We look at developing athletes individually and together as a unit over time, over years. To an individual athlete, though, winning a single seat race might seem critical, and they may not be wrong if they are in the margin, but they don't perhaps prioritize the same long-term perspective or share the same goal. 
success can see, be seen differently depending on the level of the athlete. Um, just the other day, I had to discuss with a very depressed athlete um, how to define her success. She was used to being the star in college. She was the star of under 23s. And now she was last. And I had to tell her, and she's looking at the rankings on the water, racing in the pairs. She's last with this partner. She's last with that partner. She's second to last with this partner, last with that partner. And she's like, well, I have to, I have to win in the pairs. And I said, no, you need, you need to redefine success for you in this moment. For this year, your, your definition of success is going to be not so very last. If you put success as your goal, it's going to be exhausting, and you're going to be in tears every day after practice. You need to make your goal smaller. Make it five seconds closer to less than last. Um, this was a very difficult concept for a young athlete to look in the long term. And she has to trust me to understand that I have seen her, our versions of her, year after year. And I have seen what the effect of the pressure of trying to always come first has done. So it is her choice. I can tell her my, with my experience, what you need to do is reset your goal. Or I tell her, you're right. You need to be in the top of these pair fields. Um, that is that is your definition. But because she was young, adopting the goal of not so very last is the appropriate step for her. Summing up. <laughs> My time is closing. As one who prefers to work through conversations with you and conversations with uh, athletes and other coaches, um, these challenges can be daunting. We are made stronger by discussions, and in this discussion, I look forward to continuing to move on to questions as the conference continues. Thank you for this opportunity to share my thoughts on how best to improve athletes and teams. This is a fascinating time in sport, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laurel. Thomas, welcome. I put it a little up. Can you hear me? OK. Um, how much time do I have? Because I can talk for days. 15 seconds. OK. <laughs> OK. To be honest, I will, I've come here to share my work with you. And then I hope later on you will give something back to me so I can learn and my crews can be faster. So now I'll give you what I have time to. And um, I'll just go straight on and start explaining about the work we are doing in Denmark. Um, we all talk about how much we train and how hard and what we do. So this is how we train now in Denmark. So uh, on average, we train about 20 hours a week. Maximum, we can go up to 25 hours in one week. And then minimum, 15 hours. So that's how we put the training together. And that's actually a bit of a change just for Four or five years ago, we trained much more different. So this is how it looks now. We do polarized training. So we also trained how the intensity in the training, because now we train more volume. So we cannot do what we did four or five years ago. Um, this is old news I, about our intensity zones. I presented it was in 2012. I showed these intensity zones. This is almost like in 
every other countries. It's not much difference, maybe a little higher or a little lower. But these are, are the zones we are using to define how hard they are going to train in the different sessions we are doing. Um, this here, I cannot show you everything, unfortunately. I would like to do it, but I'm not allowed. We have this point system that we use to figure out how hard the training is, but I'm not allowed to show you. So, but I can show you all. This is a, a program, actually, on how it could look in a week, on a, in the fall. And the colors defined the intensities. Um, if you look in the bottom, you can see here. It's actually yes, a bit of stroke rates. It defined also the intensity. So this week here, it's all low intensity training. Um, we also have three times of weight training during this week. We have a little gymnastics and a, all of the train, the rest of the training is biking, running, swimming. So in, in a week like this, rowing would be about seven, eight hours, then about five to six hours of uh, weight training, one or two hours of gymnastics, and then the rest is what we call alternative training. That could, so that could be maybe five, six hours. It depends on, they have to adjust them by self. When I make this program, I know there's not 20 hours in this program. There would only be 10, 12 hours of training. So they have to put on by themselves the rest of the training. And then they have to look at the heart rate and they don't allow to go. They have to be in what we call D zone. And I can go back if you want to, so you can see here. So the most of the training is in that zone. It's about 70, 80 percent in that zone. In this period, we only have maybe 30 minutes in high intensity aerobic training. Um, just to show you how it could look, this is a couple of weeks before the World Championships. You can see there are more red colors, yellow colors. It means more intensity. Also, we still try to keep about 20 hours. So here it's more rowing and less alternative training and less weightlifting, weight training. So this is two. So you can see how it changes from when we are in the racing period and then when we are in volume training. Then I can tell you about, as I started earlier, we have made some changes in, in our training in the Danish uh, program. Um, before the Olympics in, in Rio, we were, well, I would call it a lightweight nation. All our training was, was lightweight, all our success was in, in the lightweight boat class. And after the lightweight four was uh, phased out, we need to do something else. So that's why we, we changed our training. Um, before the Olympics, we wasn't training that much volume. It was about between 10 to 12 hours per week. Almost no weight lifting, no weight training. So it was just rowing. It was high intensity aerobic training. We have also tried the same training with our open class rower and what we see, it was not, they was not having the same success as our lightweight rowers. So we thought maybe that kind of training was not working for the big guys, big girls. It seems like a big uh, body, 100 kilos, forth and back in 32, many hours a week. It seems it was not working. It was too much energy spent on just moving forth and back. So that's why we try to do like everybody else do put on volume, put intensity down. Um, just to show, I'm not afraid of changing the training. I would not be afraid of going back. And I can show you why. This here is a guy who has put all the study together. 
And this is just to show if you do volume training, it works on your body. If you do high intensity training, it will work on the body. It will make the same changes inside your body. The matter, the speed of the changes in your body is depending on how often you train, how much volume and the intensity. But in the last end, you will come out with the same. So in my opinion, you can train how you would like to. I train what I think is best and what works for us in, in Denmark. But you can do it however you want to. It still works. It's just a matter of frequency in the training. That's the most important thing, and that's how fast the adaption in the body comes. It's frequency in the training. So this is just to show how I think. Um, then people would like to know how about the technique. We don't have any secrets about our technique. It's just like everybody else using your legs, using your trunk, and using your arms. But of course, it's not that simple. But you have to do it in the right way. But rowing is simple. Maybe it's difficult, but it's still simple. So boats who row fast is just because they're a little better of doing this than the competitors, a little better of the timing. So what I think matters is the boat feeling, how the rowers are feeling the boat, feeling their body, because we can see we can have rowers that it seems like they do, they move the body right, but they don't move the boat. So something is, there's a missing link. Um, also timing if the, in the movement is important. I don't care if they open the trunk a little earlier or a little later. If I can see that they feel the boat, they feel how the connection with the boat and body, I don't care how it, I don't have an exact point how the technique should look. I look at the boat and the rowers and see how it works. Um, and then one important thing for me is I wrote here, because I don't know the word in English, don't destroy the water. For me, the catch is the most important thing of, thing of the rowing. And you can put, how you put the blade in the water, you can, as I said, you can destroy the water. If you put it wrong in the water, the water will move around the blade and you will lose the grip. So it has to be put in right. So you, the oar will go in what I call water that is not moving. So for me, that's essential to look at, how you put the blade in the water, and then actually for me, the rest of the stroke doesn't matter. Um, this is just to show how I work. This is some of Valerie's um, measurements of our men single scholar, Swery. Um, you can see this is his first mission was in 2015. And I start working with Swery uh, last year, 2018, and he has done a lot of uh, progress in his um, technique. So just to shortly show you where he has found speed that he moved up to the final and up among the best now. Um, the focus for me has been on, on his legs, how he worked with his legs, the leg speed how fast he moves his legs, and it's just not fast legs, it's where in the stroke the legs moves, and of course with connection to the water. Also, the trunk, how do he, how do he use his trunk? Um, and then there's also a picture of boat acceleration. I don't know if you can see the changes. I can, I can try to tell you what the changes is. You can see he has have more leg speed, he has increased his leg speed. Also in recovery before catch, he has more speed. That would say his speed towards the catch is higher. So he has more speed out at the catch. It will also give more energy in the muscle. You build up energy when you go fast. So when you turn the direction, you will have more power. Um, so you can see here, it's the legs works affect the acceleration of the boat. See here. 
very important to move the boat is that you have very deep, that the boat stops and accelerates, that has to be in a short time and with much higher peak. On the same time, just to explain so you can see how much speed we can find in technique, you can see here, as I know, showed you, he has 16% more force, 7% longer stroke. That gives him a combination of 20% more rowing power. But in the same period of those years, in the ergometers, he has had an increase of 3% in his rowing power. So the development he has had is coming from technique and not from power. So in Denmark, we work with the technique, we work with the boat feeling, because you can have fast improvement, and in my opinion, there's no limit of how much speed you can find in technique. We don't know it yet, but we have, in the power of the rower, we have some limits. We know here, and then they hit a peak, and then it's difficult for the rowers to add more power. It's just training to let them stay there, and then we can work with the technique over years and find more speed. This is um, Sverry. You can see this is from last year. And then later on, there's some video from this year's rowing. And try to look at what I showed you before. Leg speed, trunk, catch. This is just coming from Sverry, what he thinks when I talk to him. I don't know if you can see it, but I can see the difference. Maybe it's not that big, but it has a big influence on, here, on the boat speed. If you saw it, he has a little more speed in his legs. He uses his upper body later in the stroke and also the arm was finishing more alone. And of course, his recovery, the speed of how he comes from the fins to the catch has changed a bit. Um, a lot of people saying to me, oh, he is not sitting correct in the boat. He has this round back. I don't care. He moves the boat and he has the feeling and that's what is important for me, he knows how to put the blade in the water. Um, we have talked about when I start coaching Sverry, he didn't, I asked him how was this session, how was this stroke, and he was not able to put words on. So we talked about putting words on how the rowing is feeling. So I stopped him, when I could see he made changes, I stopped him and I asked him what he was feeling. So he learned to put on words because the more words he can put on, he can give me as a coach more to work with and I can give him something back to him. So I talk a lot during training. Sometimes he tells me, shut up, give me five minutes where I just can roll. And I, okay, I shut up for five minutes <laughs> if it's possible. So it's a lot of talking about how the rowing is feeling. Because if you don't have feeling, if you are not able to put words on what is happening, then in my opinion, it's difficult to learn people to row. How is my time? I have plenty of time. I've been too fast. Um, I don't know because, let me just see the next slide. I will wait with that for the next uh, session. I just wanted to be sure I was not talking too much, so I was hurrying through the <laughs> my speech. Maybe there's time for some questions. If, if any questions, I can explain more about the training programs if you want to. Yes? Yeah, a quick question about that video. What is 
What was his gearing? Um, actually, I haven't changed his gearing. So it's just an average gearing. He is not heavy. He's, he's uh, one meter and 60 in the span. He's always 180, 89. And inside, I think it's uh, 88. So it's just an average gearing. I don't think you make any difference if I change his gearing, longer or shorter oars, it will change his feeling, but it's not changing the speed of the boat. He will just adapt the rowing to the new gearing and he will go the same speed. Maybe he will go one stroke rate higher or maybe two stroke rates lower, but the speed will be the same. So I don't use a lot of time spending on gearing. I just Look at the boat, look at the rower, and see if it's working. I mean, if it's working, it's an opportunity to go fast. More questions for Lorraine or, or Thomas? Just one question. Yes. Mr. Job Slovenia, uh, your methods about this discussion that is not very common in the here is that come from, from you as a rower that. Uh, the method, this discussion about trying to feel the boat, trying to feel the difference. Yes. Have you worked like that during your athletes career? So you try to pass and to, to educate athletes like that now? Um, no, actually, w w when I was a rower myself, my coach talked to me, talked to me, and I sat left with a lot of words and feeling. And I also would like to tell the coach, but this is not feeling right. This is not... I can feel when we do this, it's more boat speed. So when I start coaching, I think there is a lot of knowledge that is in the boat, and I need that knowledge, because it's for me, it's a working with the, with the athletes and the coach, and you can, if you work together, you can find more speed. So I think the rowers sit in the boat, they can feel more that I can see. So I need them to explain what they are feeling, because then I can recognize how it was feeling when I was in the boat myself. So when they give feedback, I can say, ah, it feels like that. Then I remember when I was in the boat, if we do this, it was better. So that's why I need them to tell me how it feels. Is it heavy? Is it slow? Is it quick? Is it light? That kind of words. Thank you. Do we still have time? Yeah. Hello. Uh, there is different uh, work and uh, weight session between uh, uh, lightweight and heavyweight till the air. Could you say it again? There is difference between uh, weight session uh, for the lightweight and heavyweight. Yes. Of course, when we do uh, weight training with the, uh, with the big guys or girls, um, some of them need to put on weight. So there's a lot of volume, hypertrophy in the training to get more muscles. When we did it with the lightweights, it was a short session just to, to keep the power. So a training, lightweight session uh, training could be maybe half an hour, uh, 35 minutes or something like that. When we do a session with the open guys now, or girls, it could be up to two hours uh, lifting weights. And, and you need to do a lot of lifts uh, if you want to put on weight. So it could be 10 sets of uh, 10 repetition. That could be a session in, in the winter time. And of course, in, in the spring, it will go down maybe to three, two sets of only one or two repetition with much more weight on. But from the lightweight rowers, it was only about keeping power. So it was five sets of uh, five uh, repetitions. So, the, so there's a b difference in, in the, the training with weights. Uh, Thomas, how are you able to um, um, change his leg speed? You emphasize you did make a big change in that. Was, yeah. Did you do any specific drills? Or? It, it, it's difficult. It, 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 it's simple just as a coach to say faster legs, faster legs. But if you do that, in many cases, they will try to push harder to get faster legs. 
And if they push faster, then they will destroy the water. As I said, if they put too much power in the catch, it will be wrong. So to get faster legs, it's all about timing. It's when you open trunk and how you timing, when do you change the direction of the seat, when do you put in the blade, all of those things. So it's explaining them how to get fast legs without using more power. So, but the common mistake is to use more power and to kick the boat. They often start to kick in, in the stretcher. That's the most common mistake. So it's, that's explaining before, if you have more words, then there's a bigger chance of the athletes are understanding what you're meaning. Otherwise, there are a lot of, you can go wrong just saying faster legs. the training, uh, you talked about the fact that at your low um, intensity weeks, yeah. the athletes may have five or six hours of training they do completely independently. Yeah. Do they do it as a group? Do they have a choice about what method they use? And how do you actually regulate that? Or do you just trust them completely? Um, I'd like to have uh, trust, so I give them the training program. I only spend time with them in the boat. There I, I can do a change, but they are not being faster that I'm sitting looking at them, going on the bike, lifting weights. I have to give them trust they can be adults and do that work by themselves. So I will be there where I can do something. So then I am more focused, I will be on them 100%, my focus is on them. And then the rest of the training, they have to do it by themselves. It's just, as I said, it's physical work and they are finally capable of doing that by themselves. But they, the technique, of course, they need guidance from me, but the rest of the work, it, I don't need to be there. Yes? Should we say that is it? Then we can have a maybe yeah. small coffee break? No. <laughs> no coffee. No coffee. after the next session as well. But since we're uh, coming this far, I think it's time to introduce John. And I'll give a thank you, Laurel and, uh, and Thomas for so long. And see you later. Well, thank you for the fantastic presentations. And I think right now we have the, the, yeah, the excellent and perfect speaker to, to follow up on it. Because we touched on topics on just not what to coach, but on how to coach. And I'd like to introduce Professor John Cote from Queen's University in Kingston. And I would like to welcome him back. He has already presented yesterday and left quite the mark I've um, heard on the coaches that he has spoken to, and I would like to welcome him and to show us what he's working on, and especially what um, uh, pertinency it has on, on our beloved sport. Welcome. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Mario, for the introduction. Uh, I'd like also to thank uh, Rosie for uh, the invitation, uh, Sheila Stevens also, and uh, Paolo, who has been a big help getting me here. And so it's been, uh, it's been wonderful yesterday to meet uh, many of you, and I'm very happy to be here this morning to share some of my work. Uh, the big disclaimer is that I'm not a rower, uh, and I don't know too much about rowing, other than some research that we did. On, uh, with coaches, with expert coaches at the beginning of the 2000s in Canada. Um, but what I would like to do this morning is talk globally about research on athlete development. And uh, basically I'm going to try, I'm going to present a model of development of athletes from 
very early age, from youth, young athletes to elite performance and continued participation, and talk about some of the variables and the complexity of developing elite level athletes and developing athletes uh, over time. And also I'm going to make some big claim and some, I'm going to simplify things to a level, very simple thing, and give you some maybe key messages that you can bring. But also, so I'm going to try to go from very simple to complexity and back to, back to simple. Uh, the, the, the big thing that I would like you to think about when you think about the development of athlete is that it is the developing athlete is, is the interactions of many different systems, many different uh, variables that interact together. And I think that's kind of the assumption of this talk, is that there is not only training, it's not only coaches, there's a lot of factors that interact together to develop athletes. And it's the interactions of those systems, so when I'm talking about system, I'm talking about all those variables that interact together, so the coaches and the environment and the boat and the water and the conditions and the, the peers and the group and all these things interact together to develop athletes. And over time, if those conditions are right, then it leads to some outcomes, some performance or some long-term participation in sport. So that's, to me, that's kind of the main thing and the, the, the main message of this talk is these things interact together over time. So what I would like to do in the talk is I would like to take a developmental system perspective. So thinking about the dynamic elements that interact together and what are these things that we can control? So, so from a coaching perspective or from a club, from a rowing perspective, what are these things that you have control over that you can affect to, and that will have an impact on outcomes? Uh, and I'd like to use three variables that seems to be coming back all the time in terms of development of athletes in all sport. And those variables are the actual setting. Where are you doing sport? What, what is the place, the actual environment? Uh, the second thing is the activities. And I think this was, a, you know, the talk before was a very good demonstration of what a kind of training are you doing. Those are the activities, the, the drills, the, the conditioning, the, the type of, of uh, playing or, or game or training or practice. And then the last one is the social dynamics, so which I talked a lot yesterday in the, in the workshop, but the interactions between people. And that has a big effect also on development. So I'd like to present all this, and, and again, it is complex. There's a lot of things going on all together. Uh, and when these things align together, then it, it, it leads to, to positive outcomes. But what I'd like to do here is present some building blocks, some, some, some kind of Things, some facts, some things that we know from the research that we can apply. So <clears throat> this is a very bit, bit complex model, but it's not that complex. But it is basically looking at development of athletes over time. So that's the very important factor here is that it takes time. It takes time to develop athletes from very early age or to, to uh, later. Just going through this, you know, it, there's lots of, of things, but it, it is simple. And, and what, what, what's the most important thing here is that it takes multiple seasons, it takes multiple years to develop athletes. So that's kind of the basic timeline here at the bottom. And then if we go to the ultimate outcomes, we have three ultimate outcomes. And many people here, or many people, would really focus on performance and putting rowers on the, on the podium. And that's kind of the one goal of rowing, and that's one goal that you have as a coach. But of all the athletes that you have, not all of them will go to the Olympic. And I think one goal of sports, or the ultimate goal of sport, too, is long-term participation. And that's, when you think about rowing, that's a very important aspect of, of, of involving kids and involving athletes in rowing so that they can do it for a long period of time. So that's the participation. And we know from a lot of research that sport is one of the ideal activity for personal development. So everything is sport is perfect. There's challenges, there's enjoyment, it's fun, it's, and, and, and there's the structure of sport is perfect to develop people. 
to develop things like responsibilities and leadership and all these things. So we need to keep these three things in mind when we think about long-term development of athletes. We need to think about performance, but also about long-term participation and personal development. Uh, so that's over time. And then within a single season, there's things maybe that coaches should focus on, and, those are the co and I'll talk a little bit more about this, but competence, confidence, connection, and character. And then there's the very short period of time, the immediate sport experience. So you have a practice in the morning, right after practice, what is the experience of that athlete? Are they happy? Are they satisfied? Are they, do they want to come back tomorrow? Do they, but th that's very important, because when you think about the long-term participation, if there's no short-term, there's not going to be long-term. You need to think about a week, within a week, within a day, what are the, how do the athletes feel about practice? And then what you have here is the actual variables that we have control over, and I'll talk about this a lot more today. So, just want to talk about the outcome quickly. Three outcomes, again, that we can summarize. What is sport for? Well, sport is for the development of performance. So I think we all agree that there's a mission here and lots of money put into elite sport. We, you know, it is important that we develop elite level athletes. Everybody in the world wants to do it, and that's an important factor. That's an important component of sport. But the other one, too, is to sport as the capacity of improving health and physical and mental health. And we know that, and rowing is a great sport for that in terms of, of so we, we should not miss that and we should not forget that, that that's an other very important aspect of sport. And the last one that I talked about is personal development. So lots of lessons that could be learned from training, from participating, for competing, from being with others, for avi from having a coach, from interacting with teammates. And so all these are not conflictual, and that's an important thing. You don't have to focus on elite performance at the price of participation and personal development. And we know that. And it's important to know that, and it's important to reiterate that, that performance is not should not be a goal by itself at the price of long-term participation for a lot of athletes or personal development. So what I'm going to try to do is try to look at those variables that can lead to all these things over time. So that's the long-term aspect, and I think the problem with coaching often is that we focus on that long-term. But, but I guess the claim I want to make is that we should not. I don't think that that's important. Those things happen over time. And the one thing that we should be focusing on is those single season. So within a season, if you're a good coach or if coaches are successful, what you're going to see, you're going to see an increase in competence. So in the rowing skill, you're going to see things happening. You're going to see improvement. And that's the competence aspect of sport. The other very important thing that should be happening within, within a shorter period of time, you know, if it's nine months or seasoned, is confidence. And confidence is important with the 17, 16 year old, but it's also competent for that 25, 30 year old athletes also. But as a coach, to develop confidence, at these, it, 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 could, it would require different types of behaviors. But that's an important aspect, and confidence should increase after a season. The, the third one is connection, so the relationship. So when you're rowing, even if you're single, in terms of in a boat, there's, there's always other people. There's coaches, there's parents, there's teammates, there's opponents, and the goal of sport should be to improve those types of relationship. So that's the connection aspect. And the last one is character. So the respect for, for rules, integrity, empathy for other, compassion. So these things through sport could be developed, and that's a very important aspect of sport also. So if you think about a coach, and we did a lot of studies trying to look at seasons, and we try to look at over time, over a season, those athletes that increase in competence, confidence, connection, and character, well, they have coaches that do certain specific things that are important, and I'll talk about these things. The, 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 the most immediate experience of, of athletes is what leads to those seasonal outcome and more long-term outcome. And we call this, talk about immediate experience as interest. And you can think about things like fun and enjoyment, but if there's not an interest 
in rowing at a young age, if you get a new rower in your team, and they're 16, 17 year old, or what, whatever age they start, as a coach, you need to create interest in the sport, and you need to be able to maintain that interest. So the research on interest showed that the first stage of developing interest in anything in life is situational interest. Why are, you, why are people interested in rowing? Why do they come to you? What, what, what are the things that really trigger that interest? And usually it's the environment, the feeling, the, you know, the, 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 the being in a boat on the water where it's calm, where there, there's something that triggers that interest. You can think about interest in anything that you like in life or anything, you know, it doesn't have to be rowing, it could be something else. If you like music, certain types of music, think about what triggered that. Usually it's the environment. It's something like a surprise, novelty, something that triggered the interest. But the, that trigger of interest, sometimes it has to be maintained over time. And how do you maintain interest? Is, is, is you develop situational interest into individual interest. And probably your elite rowers that are coming back have this individual interest, the desire to re-engage, they want to come back. But that was triggered by novelty, surprise, things that you do in training that really get athletes to come back. So from situational to, to, so the goal of a coach is to develop that individual interest, where they want to come back. It's, them, it's inside, it's, it's intrinsic, it's something that they want to come back to and do. But to get to that stage, there's certain things as coaches that we need to do to, to trigger that interest. And it's not just, maybe just the training, but there's certain things, maybe some play, some, some novelty and things that we need to integrate into training. So, thinking about in, uh, situational interest and individual interest, so situational interest is really the environment, how you trigger that, and then you, the goal is to develop that individual interest. And there's this model of interest development, and I don't expect that you look or, or, or that you remember this, but I think it's important to look at it in terms of stages. How do you develop interest? And you think about anything you like, you know, you like wine, you like beer, you like music, you like reading, you like... When you develop something, an interest into something, usually it starts with a situational interest. Somebody introduced you to something. Then you move to maintain that, and then you move to another stage, emerging individual interest, and then, individ and then well-developed indiv individual interest. So your Olympic athletes would be in that stage, probably. They just want to do it. They just want. But you're starting, when they start, they're at this stage. And as coaches, I think we, know, we need to know that. Because if we give them some kind of training that has no intrinsic value, that doesn't, is not enjoyable, is not, you may lose those people. And, and those people may not come back. And if you worry about, if you really care about participation and long-term participation and not only performance, then I think it's important to try to keep those people in. So knowing where your athletes are on that continuum is, is an important thing. And again, I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure how you do that, but I think it's, it's, a, it's a conversation and it's a discussion with athletes. Where, do they, where are they at in terms of their level of interest? So those are the outcomes. So when you think about coaching, you think about long-term outcomes, you think about more seasonal or kind of uh, short-term in terms of the four C's or the three P's, the four C's, and then the interest is that immediate experience. And like I said before, this will never happen if the experience, repeated experience over time are not positive. If they are, it's gonna lead to this and it's gonna lead to that. And to me, coaching is this, it should not should not even think about those long-term things. Think about these short-term things, shorter things. And I think there's, you know, I, I agree with long-term athlete development. That that's important. It takes time. But coaches should not focus in 15 years or 10 years from now. We should focus on, on these things on a seasonal end. And if you see level of competence, confidence, and these things happening and increasing over time, it will happen over it. will, performance will happen, participation will happen, and personal development. So. I'm going to stop talking about these outcomes, but what I would like to do is talk about what is it that we have control over as coaches, as program, as coordinators of program that we can change that will allow athletes to develop interest, to develop the four C's and to develop the three P's over time. So this is where it gets a bit 
could be, I'm going to go from very complex to very simple things, but the dynamic elements that we know, and this is sport, you know, the simple, simple way of explaining what sport is, sport is what you do with who and where. So when you think about rowing, rowing it's going and training and, and going in the boat and doing some training or doing some, some uh, biking or doing some conditioning and weightlifting. That's the activity of sport. That's the thing you do. If you are a basketball player, you're going to play basketball and you're going to go training in basketball and you're going to do. So that's the activity. That's the what. Sorry, it's the personal engagement in activities. But that activities is done in a place. It's done somewhere. Rowing, it's on the water, but there's training that's not on the water. And then there's, but the actual place, the city, the club, the actual venue is where you do the rowing, where you, where you play basketball. So it's what you do, where. And there's another very important thing, there's other people. There's, there's coaches, there's peers, there's... So when you think about sport, it's what you do, where, with who. So these three things together, that's what sport is about. So as a coach, you decide the what. You decide what are we going to do today in training. You have a little bit of control, but not too much about the where. You know, you have a venue, you have a course, you have a training center, you have a club, you have a city that you're in. But you also decide a lot about the social dynamics. And that's a very important aspect of sport. What's happening in terms of interactions, interaction with the coach, interactions with others. So this, again, happened over time. So if you have younger athletes, the activities will be different. The venue may be the same, but the social dynamics could be different. So these things will change over time. And if it's ideal for an age group, it will lead to those positive outcomes. So the three gears, so at the, at the beginning of that model, are what you do, where, and with who. Okay, so this is where it could get very complex. And because, but because it is complex to develop athletes, to, think, to take someone and get them into rowing for 10 years or 5 years or 12 years. Or, so there, there's a lot of things going on. And this is where I would like to give you a little bit more complexity to the whole thing. So when you think about the setting where you row, so, so everybody has a club, has a place where they, they row. So that setting is, and I call it here, the playing field, and it, I, I realize that it's not maybe the best word for rowing, but the venue, the actual rate, the actual course that you're using, the club that you're at. So that's the, the setting, the, where, where you put the boat in the water, and the water you're rowing on, that's the place, the place where you're rowing. But that playing field, or that venue, is part of a bigger club and organization structure, organizational structure. So the actual, so I'm just looking at this one here for now. So the actual setting is there's the actual place where you row, but that's within a club. So I want you to look at the, all of these variables as there's a proximity, but then it gets, there's certain things that affect that, from, that, that are more distant. And I think we need to realize that, because where you are, is really an important part, and I'll give you some research that really show that, that really show that there are certain places that are better than others. But we need, and again, you cannot change the place where you're at, but, but you, can, you can try to think about ways that maybe internally you could, you could make some modification. So that's the club and organization, and then there's the community or the league or the structure of that, of that club. So you're in a city, you're in a country, in a specific country, and that, again, that specific country, the rules the affect the club and affect what you do as a coach. Okay, so that's the setting. And the thing is, is that you can look at each one of those and you see those different layers that move from what you do as a coach to things that affect what you do as a coach. So in terms of activities, there's the, the athletes that are involved in rowing, they're doing rowing, but maybe there's a lot of athletes that are doing other sports too. So other sports that may be complementary to rowing. So that's the second layer here. And then there's complementary activities. So your athletes, they go to school, maybe they play music, maybe they have life outside of school and they do other things. So that, again, it affects their performance in rowing. So sometimes we think more about the very proximal proximal relationship, but there's things 
more distance that will affect what you do as a coach. And when you think about the social dynamics, it would be the same thing. The closer social dynamics would be coach-athlete relationship. That's an easy thing to, well, you know, some kind of easy thing to, to, to control. But there's also the team dynamics. So coach-athlete relationship, but athletes together. And then the team together. And then the, that's also part of a social environment. In a specific town or in a specific place, there's other interactions with sponsor, with other people that could also affect performance and, and the audience and the spectators and all those things. So that's, when you're looking at this, you say, whoa, okay, there's a lot of stuff going on here in terms of, of uh, uh, these things interacting together to lead to outcomes. So, <laughs> Lots of stuff going on. But I think what's important to see, so again, those are the three variables, the three variables we have control over. So the, the setting, the environment, the activities, and the, the social dynamics. And what I want you to think about is that when, you know, the team dynamics, if you work on this, and if you work on, that's going to affect the relationship, it's going to affect the environment, it's going to affect how the, how the athletes are involved in the activities, and it will affect maybe how they get involved in other things, and it, so, the whole point here is that you could, I, could, I could have put arrows all over the place here because you can work on here the sport of interest, you know, and you, we saw the presentation, the first presentation we talked a lot about training. What is, what is it, you know, training intensity and volume and all these things. That's very important. It's a very important thing. But that's going to affect probably the coach-athlete relationship. How are you going to do that? And that's going to affect it could probably affect the team dynamics also. So when you think about an intervention at one level, will affect things at the other levels. And I think the thing to think about as a coach is that maybe your intervention didn't work, but it's maybe because not of the intervention, but other factors that affected that. So what I'm gonna do is just take each one of these gears. So I'm gonna start with setting. So that's the first gear that, so, so the environment, the setting. So within the setting, we had three levels. So we had the levels of the playing field, the actual venue the, the, where you row, the club and the organization, and then the community structure. So I'm gonna take each one of these gears, I'm gonna show you some of the research that affect, so all these, the, the environment affect performance, participation, personal development. And I'm going to give you a very simple message about that research. So I don't expect everyone to read that research, but I'm going to give you something, and then I'm going to make it more complex again. So I'm going to go from, from, from very complex to simple and back to complex. So when you think about the venue, the environment, the thing is, is that that's probably the one variable where you don't have as much control. You know, you are with a club, you are in a certain country, you are in a city, you are in a place where access to is good or it's not that good, or access to the actual venue. Or, so there's things that sometimes you cannot control as well. Uh, and I think that's an important one. But the thing is, is that we know through research that that venue, that setting does affect long-term development. So when you think about the setting, the playing field, the, the club, and the community, what do we know from the research? So at each of these levels, so I'm talking about here the level, and I'm going to talk about them from level one, level two, level three. The level one is the most proximal one, where you row, the actual venue the place. Lots of research done on this, mostly in team sport, not a lot in individual sport, but what we know from this research is that adapting the venue, adapting the, 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 the setting through some kind of competitive structure, and I think the best example here I have is probably, and I don't know, you're going to have to help me with rowing, but it's probably thinking about soccer. You know, when you have 10 years old soccer, what they do, they call it competitive engineering. So they would, they would modify the game for younger kids. It's not the game of soccer at 10 doesn't look like the game of soccer at 25. They adapt the game. They adapt the environment. 
The, so, and I think I want to think about this in terms of, you know, and small-sided games and these things. So think about this from a rowing perspective. What does it mean? And I know that rowing is a late starting sport where, where mostly most people come in as adults. But if you have younger people, younger kids or beginners that are in that situational interest phase, what do you do to adapt the environment so that it's going to create interest and it's going to create long-term positive outcomes. So that's at the level of the venue. The level, so again, there's certain things you can do, prop, maybe not, you, maybe you're limited. I'll talk about some of these things a little bit uh, later. But at the second level is the organization of the club in terms of the structure of the club. How do you group athletes together? The best athletes together or not? Or there's certain, and again, a lot of research on the relative age in terms of uh, maturity of athletes and, and when they compete together. But I think those decisions, you have a bit of decision to make about these things in terms of how you're going to structure that. So, so that's at the level number two. And then at the community and league, we know from research that there are certain community that produce more elite level athletes and more long-term participation than others, cities. And I'll talk a little bit about this. So what do we know from level one, two, and three? So again, lots of research on over many years in terms of the environment. Well, the main message here is that size of the actual venue, the actual club, and the community, the accessibility, and the competitive structure has huge effect on short-term and long-term outcomes in sport. So when I think about size, think about the size of your team, think about the size of your club, think about the size of the city that you're in. And these things, again, you cannot change that, you cannot change the size of the city, but it seems to be that smaller city or, or, or medium-sized cities around the world have a better success of producing elite-level athletes. And again, you know, when we did those studies, like people were calling and said, well, should I move my kids to a smaller city? You know, I live in Calgary, and then should we move to a smaller city, or, or I live in Toronto? And the, the point is not that. The point is what happens in bigger cities when you think about ice hockey in Canada. Well, if you play ice hockey in Canada and Toronto, what you're going to do is at 10 year old, they're going to tell you very quickly if you're good or not. So that's the confidence aspect. They're going to, because you're going to have a training camp with many kids, because there's lots of kids. But if you play in a smaller city, you're going to think you're good because there's not a lot of kids playing. But I think that's kind of the point, you know, thinking about confidence, connection and character and competence. These things may naturally more happen in a, in, in a better way in smaller kind of environments. Uh, the accessibility is huge, and rowing it's probably is a big thing, you know, in terms of, and, and there's studies that have been done in terms of uh, looking at the, the, where athletes come from, in terms of if they're close to a, to a big club or not. So accessibility, but you can think about this, you know, you cannot move the river, or the, you cannot move the lake, or you cannot move the, the venue, but can you provide better access to those, to those things. And finally, the competitive structure. Do you have athletes competing at, at different level, uh, different age group, different size, kids of different size, and things like this? It affects them. So that's kind of the setting and the environment. I think the, 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 the important thing here is to think about setting. And if you think about level one and two, thinking about way that you can affect those settings and those environment. And you really, I, I made some guesses here, but you know, in terms of modifying the facility, uh, you know, I was talking to some rowing coaches that will, with, with smaller kids, they will bring them, it doesn't have to be a straight course, and, but bringing them in a, in a shelter bay and doing certain things that are fun, playing, playing games or doing, doing things in a boat that would, be, that would get them used to the water, the feeling of the boat, and these, these kind of things. You can modify the, modify the, uh, the equipment, talk about some smaller boats with, with kids maybe that are more stable, where they get again a sense of, of the activity, a sense of, of, of the water and, and the, the, actual, uh, the actual act of rowing. Uh, thinking about uh, choice of competition, so that's modifying the environment in terms of meaningful races. You know, do you get athletes to get to enter, and that's engineering the competitive environment, which is huge, it could be big, to, to make sure that athletes have success at some point. 
so putting kids from different ages or different ability together, but giving certain advantage to certain people that are better or so that there's opportunity for everyone. The bird place effect, so I talked a little bit about this in terms of, but lots of studies here showing that size of the city matters and also accessibility, so, so proximity to a club. So again, that's a hard one to change. You're not gonna change the club, you're not gonna change the size of the city, but thinking about what is it in the size of a city that makes it that smaller cities have better, better kind of, of, of outcomes. And I think we need to think about interactions and we need to think about activities and we need to think about that social dynamics that's happening. You know, I'm giving this lecture and there's, I don't know, maybe there's 100 people in the room. It would be very different if I was doing it with five people with just this table here. We would have a discussion, we, we could. So, so these things, size is an important thing. Number of people is an important thing when you're coaching and when you're trying to establish those relationships. So, when you think about the environment and the physical setting, we need to think about the physical setting, the environment, as affecting the other two variables where you have more control, the activities and the social dynamics. So the setting affects that. And when I gave the example of giving this in front of 100 people versus giving this with five people, what we would do if it was five people, we would have a discussion, we would have a different types of interaction. There would be a different types of social dynamics involved. There would be some different types of activities we can do. Right now I'm just talking, you guys are listening, there's not a lot going on in terms of interaction. Uh, so, so, and again, it doesn't mean that you're not learning anything, but maybe there would be a better way to do this if, if we had opportunity and if we had the, the um, the resources to do this at, with smaller, smaller groups. So what does the, think about the environment, the, the setting, so size, accessibility, competitive structure of the environment will lead or will affect the activities, the relationship, the social dynamic and the activities, and then over time it will lead to those outcomes, those ultimate outcomes that we want to achieve. So I'm gonna move now to the, uh, the activities, I believe, yes. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about this one here, so personal engagement and activities, and I'm probably not gonna tell you anything new about what you need to do as a coach in terms of training, but what I want to do is try to put it into a bigger pictures of the actual microscopic aspect of training how does it fit in an athlete's life in terms of other types of activities? And, and I think that's important to keep that in mind, is that that microstructure of practice that, you, that is very, very important also fits within a, a bigger macro structures of things, of activities that athletes are involved in their life. And if we don't think about that, then the microstructure of practice, you can do something very, very good, but if those other things affect it, it's not gonna work, or it, it, will, it will impair the, the, uh, the actual uh, outcomes. So when you think about activities, again, you think about, we're not gonna, I'm not gonna do, not do too much here, but thinking about the actual practice, the actual training, the actual competitive schedule that you have, all these things, that's the, that's the most proximal thing. But if you have athletes that are starting, they're probably involved in other physical activities also. Maybe they play basketball, and, or maybe they, uh, they do other things. Uh, they're, they're doing some biking, or they're biking, and they're, they're doing other sports. So that's the other, the other layer here. And then the other thing that's also important, but that is more distal, is that your athletes have a life outside of sport. They're doing other things. They're doing school. They're doing, they're, I don't know if they're, or they're, maybe they're working, or they have, um, maybe involved in music or arts or other things outside of sport. So when you think about these layers, and when we think about the research, so again, I'm just gonna present the research at each one of these level and give you a very key principle or what do we know from that research. From the sport of interest, you probably heard about this deliberate practice idea. Anders Ericsson in 1993 wrote a paper with musician, 10,000 hours of deliberate practice. This was made very popular by Malcolm Gladwell. 
that you know talked about this this everybody anybody could become a concert pianist or an Olympic rower if you start early and you do a lot. If you do 10,000 hours of deliberate practice, you could achieve whatever you want in life. If you start early and you get involved. And deliberate practice is not enjoyable. It requires a lot of concentration. And the goal is to improve performance. So that makes sense. You know, If I want to be a tennis player, start early, do a lot. The problem is we're not robots. And the problem is, is that people have emotion, and people have motivation, and people have injuries. And, and if you have this type of training at a very early age, it doesn't, and, and the literature, and, and since that, since, since that 93 paper, people have shown that, you know what, it doesn't work that way. There's a lot of other things that athletes should do, and should be doing, that are very important towards participation, performance, and personal development. And we, in 99, we came up with this idea of deliberate play. The idea of deliberate play is the opposite of deliberate practice. So it's enjoyable, it's not to improve performance, but it's, it's done with the goal of, 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 of having fun in sport. And that's how kids start in sport. When you think about, and, and I'm not sure if that's how they start in rowing, but at some point, there has to be something positive about the act of rowing. There has to be something, a feeling of, 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 of satisfaction, of, of enjoyment that, that comes from the act of rowing. And that's, that would be the closest to deliberate play, where you get in the boat and that's just for fun. That's just enjoyable. And there has to be moment of that in an athlete's career. Uh, so at the second level, the idea of early sampling, early specialization, again, it's been quite, just got a paper published, a, 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 very, a systematic review done with, uh, with uh, people in, in medicine. Now they're doing a lot of work looking at injuries. And the early sampling approach as gaining a lot, a lot more uh, evidence that athletes should not specialize in one. And I don't think rowing is a big problem with this. I think you have athletes that are coming in a little late and have done other sport. But I think it's important to think about it from a point of view of while they're doing rowing, is that too much? Should we allow them to or should we try to get them to do other things? And that's kind of the idea of sampling. And then finally, the uh, engagement in diverse activities. Okay, and I think in developmental psychology has been shows quite strongly that people that are involved in other things in their life seems to be more balanced and have a more uh, balanced uh, view of their life and, and, and how they, what they want to get. So doing music and, in, and keep getting involved in other types of activity. And if you think about it from a performance perspective, you can think about it about sleeping and performance and, and, and all these things that need to be combined into an athlete's life. So what do we know about level one, level two, and level three in terms of the activity? Well, probably a lot of researcher will, would grinch here, but there's one word that summarizes all this. And you probably don't have to read all these papers, but I think the word that summarizes all this at all these levels is diversity. And diversity, so when you think about diversity within rowing, it means that you just don't do deliberate practice, that they will be periods of play, that they will be, per and I think the speakers before highlighted it very well, that it was 20, 25, uh, 20, 20 hour, 25 hours of rowing, but that included biking, it included conditioning, it included weightlifting, and there was about 15 hours or something like this of rowing. So the diversity within is such an important aspect of sport. So, and, and I think it could happen. What, is, what does play look like in rowing? I'm not sure what it looks like. I talked to some coaches, but, but I think it's possible. There's play, there's games. Can, can, you, can you do some games? Can, can, are there some th certain things that would be just, you know what, today we're playing. We're trying to have fun. We're gonna do something that's gonna be fun and it's gonna be play, it's not gonna be practice. Be between sport, diversity is also very important. Diver so, and again, this is the idea of sampling, doing different sport, a very important aspect of development. And then, and then, and then at the next level would be doing things like music and stuff. So, so again, lots of research, lots of work, but this diversity idea is a very important one. I just want to show you this in terms of thinking about different types of activities. So within rowing, within one sport, 
You know, you can have things that are led by adults, by you and the coach. So this is deliberate practice. So that would be the type of practice where I'm coming as a coach, I'm telling you what to do, that's what's important towards your progression, and that's what we're doing. But there's things you can do as a coach, too, that are more, look like more like play, play practice, where you, we're going to have practice, we're going to have things to do and just for fun. Not necessarily the best way to improve your technique and your performance. But there's also things that could, and ultimately that's what coach wants to do. Coach, they want athletes to go out and have fun and play and, and, and do, and that's the idea of deliberate play. And I think that idea is a lot easier to communicate in a sport like basketball, but it would be this idea of kids going outside, they'll play basketball for fun, there is no focus on performance. They make errors, nobody tells them that they make an error. They just keep playing. But they're learning from that. So what does that look like in, in rowing? It would be those people that just ask you to take the boat out and they just want to go row just for the fun of it. For the, and then there's this idea of spontaneous practice where athletes will go by themselves, work on their technique. They, they don't have a coach to tell them what to do. But those, again, this is just examples of different types of activities that could be done within one sport. And we know that Doing these different types of activities is, are very important, the diversity and the variation of things. Uh, across sport, so between sport, again, I talked about the idea of sampling. What does sampling mean? So people you know, always come to me and say, well, sampling, if I want to be a tennis player, why should I play basketball? If I want to be a rower, why should I, you know, I don't know, play uh, ice hockey or whatever? Uh, and I think the idea is, sure, from a skill perspective, it could help. But to me, the most important thing here is motivation and the interaction with different types of people, different group, different social dynamics. You know, rowing looks very different from tennis. That's, that's a, but, but the rowers, they're, they're, if they try both and they, and they pick rowing, it's because there's something there that attracts them. But if they get involved, and I think the most, you know, I think to me the, the where we see a lot of dropout and a lot of injuries is, is a sport like gymnastics, which is completely opposite of rowing, but you know, where they get in at a very early age and then they're successful and then everybody tells them that they're successful and they're good and then suddenly there's a lot of pressure for them to stay in the sport because of, of what they're doing and because of the success that they have. And that creates more practice, more training, more injury, and suddenly they lose control over their participation. So, what sampling allows people to do is try different things. So think about interest, situational interest. There's certain things in your life that you, you tried, but you didn't like, and you stop. But I think allowing people to make that decision is the key factors here when we think about motivation. And if we want to develop, engage interest, engage athletes, we need to be able to give them choices. Uh, so. I don't know if some of you are familiar with this model. I'm not going to spend much time on it, but this is a model that uh, was published in 1999, so a long time ago. Uh, but basically what we have in this, and this is kind of summarizing all the research on the activities, but there's two pathways towards elite performance, participation, and personal development or enjoyment. And one is early specialization. So lots of deliberate practice, not a lot of deliberate play. And what happened here is that, yes, there are some studies that show that it leads to elite performance, but it also leads to less participation, less enjoyment, less personal development, and also a lot more dropout. And as I said, I was in, uh, a couple of months ago at a, at a conference in Houston with, um, with uh, sport medicine where they're really getting into this because it, this idea of early specialization and now doctors are prescribing uh, kids to play a lot of different sports and not specializing in one because of injury and injury rates and, and, and it's getting out of control. They're, they're, the, 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 the physicians are doing procedures now on kids that they, they used to do on adults at tw with 20 years because there's over, overuse, overuse injuries and things like this. So that's the early specialization pathway. An alternative of that would be the sampling years. 
till about 12, 13, 14. It could vary here the age and don't, stuck, don't get stuck on the age. But the importance of sampling before you specialize, They're doing different sport, doing some play, having fun in sport, then focusing. So that develop interest, that develop that individual interest that's important, and it also leads to performance, participation, personal development. So after the sampling years, the nice thing here is that you develop an interest and you can keep rowing for fun, that's the recreational aspect, or you can try to get to the Olympic by going specializing in investment. And again, the studies would show that this kind of pathway is very healthy and leads to elite performance without sacrificing participation and personal development. I, I just wanted to flash these two papers. I think we, I worked last year with the NBA uh, coming up with guidelines. And, and you know, I, again, this is something very simple, the, 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 the idea of sampling. But the idea of diversity and sampling when you think about it from the level, the, the level, uh, level one, level two, level three, at the level of rowing, but also at the level of a person's life, has so much implication. And you can come up with guidelines. You can come up with ways that you can play with that. And I think, to me, that's the most important aspect of coaching. I think coaches just need some kind of guidelines similar to this. And that's what we provided here. We, we gave the NBA some guidelines and say, coaches, that are, you know, when you have those tournaments in, in, in basketball, kids should not play seven games in one day. You know, there, there are certain things here that, that and, and then we just kind of say, okay, there should be some kind of rest and some kind of, of things. And, and so you can look online uh, at the guidelines. There's just tables in terms of how we've kind of looked at this. I mentioned a little bit before the, the work we did, and I'm still quite involved with uh, sport medicine in terms of early specialization and coming up with definition. What is early specialization? So we need to think about intensity, number of sport, but we also need to think about some kind of range and, and what does it look like. And we don't have very good definition yet. Okay, so the last thing I want to talk about is the relationship. So I talked a lot about this yesterday, uh, but I'd like to kind of look a little bit about, so, so you could have very good activities in a, in, a, in a great setting, but if people don't get along, and if, pe and if you're not able to communicate with your athletes, and if your athletes are not able to, there's gonna be an issue, there's gonna be a problem. So, that, so when you think about those three gears, they have to work together. And so I'll talk a little bit more, especially about the relationship, the coach-athlete relationship here, but there's also the team dynamics and also the social environment. So what do we know? It's probably the area where there's the most research when you think about relationships, social dynamics, and sport. And I'll put the three levels now. So at the level of the relationship, lots of research done on relationship quality, autonomy, supportive coaching. Yesterday I talked about transformational coaching, transformational leadership. Uh, and then you can go on and talk about parental support. You can talk about assistant coaches. So there's tons of relationships. There's many relationships in sport that, but you know, at, at a certain level, cannot control everything. So, so that's at the level of one-on-one. -on -one. There's a lot of research on team dynamics in terms of cohesion, in terms of motivational climate, social identity. So all these things that happen more at a team level. And then there's less interaction, but a little bit at the organizational structure. So the organizational aspect of sport the interaction at that level. So peer interactions or uh, kind of organizational uh, variables. So what do we know about this? So again, going from many years of research on social dynamics, what is the main message of these studies? What is the main thing? Well, again, those were a bit difficult to do, but the main point here is that the social dynamics you know, at the, at the level one, level two, and level three, at the one-on-one -on -one and, and at team dynamics, it should help athletes feel that they are important and what they do is important. That's the key. If we're able to do this, then you get a social dynamic that is working and that's gonna work very well with the activities and the environment and then you're gonna, you're gonna have an opportunity to develop those outcomes. But how do you achieve that is kind of the, you know, the, the one thing here that we don't 
we, we try to understand what, how that works, but it's a very important thing that is very specific to different contexts and different types of environment. So bringing back the complexity of this, uh, I think I want to talk a little bit about leadership, and I talked about this yesterday quite a bit, so the workshop that we do on transformational coaching. But you think, think about <coughs> dynamic at the level one, the one-on-one -on -one relationship as a leadership kind of perspective. And when you think about leadership, you can think about leaders that are effective and leaders that are less effective, and then that leaders that are very engaged or that are not engaged. So as, as a leader that is engaged and that is not effective, it's that toxic leader. So that toxic leader is the coach that yells, the coach that, you know, where it, they create an environment where it's abusive, it's not good for the athletes, and it's not a good type of, and it's, we know that that type of coaching, that type of leadership does not work. It, does, it is not associated with positive, it's not associated with high level of performance, long-term participation, and personal development. At the other side of this, if you have an athlete, if you have a coach that is not engaged and doesn't do anything, they just look at their phone while athletes are, or they're checking their email or doing other things, that's laissez-faire, and laissez-faire, we know that is not effective either. The neutral is, through our observation studies, this is where we see most of the coaches. So coaches that are neutral are coaches that are very boring, and they're just going like this, and they're just telling you to go there and do this and do that, and then there's no enthusiasm in any tone, a motivational tone, or, and again, it's right in the middle, because, you know, it could be effective, but it's probably not the most effective thing. So coaches are just coming in, and this is, this is what we, this is the drill, and that's, you go there, and that's, let's do 20, 20 times this, and three times that, and then let's, okay, so we're done. So that's the, that's the neutral aspect. The, the other one that's, again, that kind of go from effective or ineffective is the transactional. Talked a lot about this yesterday. What is a transactional style of leadership is to use awards and punishment. It works. Uh, it works. Uh, so if I tell you that, uh, you know, the first person who's going to ask a question after my presentation, I'm going to buy them a beer tonight. Okay, I don't know. Maybe it's not going to work, but uh, maybe that's going to be a punishment. Uh, but, but if you, basically, you're, you're, you're promising, you're, it's a transaction. So you're going to do something for me, and I'll do something for you. Okay, so for those of you who have kids, it does work. Uh, you know, kids that uh, are not behaving, and then you, you try to get them, and then you're going to get them ice cream, or if you go to bed early, we're going to do this, or they, they, you know. So, so why do it, does it not work? Why, why is it, why could it be ineffective? You don't have to answer, you can answer if you want, but for those of you who were there yesterday, you should know. Uh, so it's ineffective because of, what, what does it do to a person is that it, kill motivation over time. So basically, the idea here is that over time, you're going to have athletes, you're going to have people that are doing something not for the intrinsic idea of doing the actual activity, but for the rewards or for the punishment. So, so transactional, again, could work. And, and when you look at all these styles of leadership, and then you have transformational there, and I'll explain a little bit more what it is, more effective and very active style of leadership. The important thing about this is that a coach cannot be 100, and we know that, again, by observing coaches, 100% transformational. People move from one style to another. But you would be identified, if I observe you, if we observe you, as a transformational coach that sometimes uses some transactional kind of intervention sometimes could be toxic. But if that toxicity is, is, is done by a transformational coach, it will be accepted, though it will be. But so, so thinking about these styles of leadership, most of that you should try to aspire to be as transformational as possible, knowing that nobody is 100% transformational all the time. So what is transformational coaching or transformational leadership? Again, we talked about it, so we have this workshop where we talked about this quite a bit, but this is the four I of transformational leadership. And it's probably not gonna go 
you know, there, 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 were, there are things that need to be explained a little bit more than what I'm going to do. But the first one is idealize influence. Practice what you preach as a coach. Be a role model. You want your athletes to be on time and practice, well, you be on time and practice. You want your athletes to do certain things, well, you do it too, yourself. Because that's how people learn. People learn by modeling others. And if you're not positive and enthusiastic in your practice, well, why do you, are you asking to do your, your athletes to do this? So, so be, modeling those types of behaviors, that's the idealized influence. The second one is inspiration and motivation, believing in your athletes, expressing confidence, having goals, expectations, things, and, and not only having those, communicating those to athletes and knowing that athletes, so believing the inspirational, what is inspirational? You know, what, what inspire you? You, you were an athlete at some point. What were some of those things that your coaches did that were inspiring? So uh, expressing, you know, when your coaches g give you a tap on the shoulder and say, good job, and that was, that was a very nice race. You did, you did very well there. And talk about that. So these kind of things inspire confidence and motivation. The, s the third one is intellectual stimulation, involving athletes in the coaching process. Okay, there's nothing easier to, to do as a coach than to tell your athletes because you know, what, you know what's good for them. You know what type of training. So this is what we're going to do today because I know I'm the coach and I know exactly what we need to do. Versus involving athletes. Okay, what should we, you know, and, and I think it's, it, it, it's, a, it's a hard balance, but getting them involved in the training. Why, why are we doing this today? Why should we doing this? Or what kind of things? You know, we should try to work on this technique today. Is there, you know, does somebody have an opinion about how we should do it? Or... So what does that mean? It, does, it involves people in the process, and sometimes it could be a bit messy. Sometimes you don't really know what you're getting back in return when you ask a question, but it involves them, and it really, again, increases the, uh, the, 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 the social dynamics. Sorry. The individualized consideration is the idea of knowing your athletes, knowing them at a personal level. And I put there person-centered coaching, not athlete-centered person-centered. So, your athletes are people before they're athletes. They have other things in their life. There's things that they care about. There's other, and how do you, what do you do to get to, to find out about that? What do you do? And, and you know, you don't want to be creepy here, but you, you just want to try to understand where are they coming from? What, what's, what's, you know, the training is not going well today. That's, thing, things are not going, What's going on? Well, I have an exam at school, and you know, like, like this is just trying to find out about these things and, and, and relationships and pro, you know, issues that could interfere with training. So knowing athletes at a personal level, getting to know them is a very important aspect. What we did over the last five years is we looked, observed coaches, and this is where transformational leadership before, became a little bit transformational coaching. You have the four I of transformational leadership here, which is the theory of transformational leadership. And then what we were able to do is try to identify with coaches of a lot of different sport, what does it look like in coaching? What does it look like in sport? And what it does is that you have this series of 11 behaviors and the workshop yesterday is really trying to work on those behaviors, trying to show those behaviors more often. And if you're able to display those behaviors more often, it has been associated with positive outcome, with higher performance, higher continued participation and level of commitment and motivation. So you could look at this, but you know, things like showing vulnerability and humility. When's the last time did you, did you, did you apologize when a training didn't go well as a coach? You know, what does that do when you apologize to someone? Well, it creates trust and respect. And, and so, so is that what you want to do? Is that the environment that you want to create in coaching, in your environment? So when athletes are making a mistake, they will come, they, there's more opportunity for them to come back and then say, you know, sorry, I screwed up here. But. So those are the types of behaviors. Again, they fit under the four I. And we have a way of measuring these, and I think that's kind of where we're going. We've been working with a lot of organization, lots of different sport uh, around the world in terms of, of, of how they implement the, the transformational coaching into their program for their coach education program. So this is really focusing on the interpersonal aspect of coaching. It's not about rowing, it's not about the sport, it's about interactions, and we know that it, that's important. <coughs> so we're trying to 
implement this and measuring these things. Again, those are measurable. Those are skills. You know, there are people in this room that are probably more transformational than others, naturally. But the thing is, is that you can learn those skills. Just like you learn techniques and you learn uh, intensity of training and volume of training and you learn all these things, you can learn to be a better communicator and to interact with others in a better way and a more effective way. And we can measure, again, this is, this is an observation system. We can go to a practice and we can look at coach-athlete relationship and try to see and tell you at the end of the day, well, you know, you had a lot of toxic behavior here or you had a lot of neutral behaviors, and then can you, you know. And, and the thing is that we're not asking coaches to do anything differently in terms of content. It's just the how. It's the, how, how do you interact? You're still going to give instruction, but there's different ways of giving instruction. So, uh, what I want to do, uh, so I'm almost done. Got another five minutes. What's important to, realize, to, 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 to think about when you look at those three gears working together is that, so that's, so bringing back to, to, to the more complex nature of coaching, which is all these things interacting together. And, and, and the, the three things together, but all the levels, the different levels also. But what's important to realize is to think about what do I want to focus on? And you're probably going to get out of this room and say, okay, well, you know, maybe I'm going to work more on the environment and I'm going to think a little bit about changing the environment or, or including, I'm going to work on the activity and I'm going to change a little bit more my training to, by incorporating a little bit more play because I think that's important. Or I'm going to work on the relationship. And when you think about, okay, some of you yesterday were in the um, transformational coaching uh, workshop. So you work on the, on the relationship one-on-one, -on -one, and by working on this, you know that it will, it will affect team dynamics. And the team dynamics will affect the social environment. And th that's gonna come back, and it will affect again. And all this, so if you work on the activity and you include more play in your training, it could affect how athletes gonna involve in other sports. And it, and then at the end of the day, I could have put a row all over the place, but the thing is that it is complex and it, all these things are interacting together, but by intervening in one thing, you will have an effect on within the gear, on the other layers, but across them also. And thinking about activity, what you do, where, and with who, and thinking about these three things together you can, you can make changes pretty quickly by identifying the right place to intervene and then and, and by doing it the, in some ways. So that's kind of my, my grad students did that. I didn't do that. Uh, but, but thinking about rowing and thinking about, you know, a boat like this, thinking about, uh, you think about the setting, you know, the, the, that boat is on the water, there's, there's, there's the... The, the, there's the wind, there's the water, there's the venue, so that's the setting, there's the club, there's the actual place that they row, and that, you know, that's the type of training that they're doing or they may be doing, so that interacts together, and then there's the social dynamics. And all this, again, all works together and lead to some outcomes. And those outcomes are better performance, long-term participation, and uh, personal development. So. What I want to conclude is you got this model with different staggered outcomes, the long-term outcomes, the more of the short-term. Uh, we can say now that the initial uh, 1700 meters option is not viable. Uh, we cannot we cannot cope uh, with the with the constraints and 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 to move uh, uh, over this bridge, having in mind that. Um, all the boats uh, uh, from the marina and from this uh, uh, part and also these boats will have to have access to the ocean from here. So it would mean uh, the 1700 meters uh, uh, option is, uh, is not possible. So this is the only alternative now that we are investigating and discussing with, the, with the LA 2028. It's a 1500 uh, uh, seven lanes um, uh, course. Again, uh, this is part of, uh, of uh, this uh, uh, discussion having, uh, that we are having with the IOC to make sure that rowing is not uh, uh, too com 
complicated with a lot of constraints and and if our community uh, at the end made this choice to exceptionally move from 2000 to 1500 for that very specific event i can tell you that the perception from the ioc there will be a really positive in a sense that rowing is flexible enough to adapt and to ensure that we will reduce uh, uh, or help in facing all the challenges the, the, uh, the organizing committee are, are, are facing. So uh, it's really important if we have, if we do believe that for the future of our sport it's important and we can move to this, obviously should all the technical aspects be uh, uh, matched uh, in terms of, uh, uh, of uh, feasibility, uh, this would be a tremendous uh, step in, in, in our discussions. Uh, moving to Paris 2024, um, as you know, the rowing will be held on uh, in Versailles. Uh, most of you will probably know the um, uh, the venue where we had in the we already had in the past some events, World Cup. Uh, uh, the um, the area has been refurbished. I mean, the, the, it's, it has been inaugurated in June, uh, in June this year, so ready to go, no problem. I won't uh, go too much into details. Uh, one aspect I would like to share with you is um, about uh, the, as you know, there is, uh, uh, it's 42 kilometers from the Olympic Village, and the organizing committee has uh, worked with the IOC actually to uh, to reduce the cost of the games. Let's uh, uh, say it that way. They have investigated all the aspects, and one of the key aspects is the size of the Olympic Village. And the Olympic Village actually is built uh, on the top uh, of on on the, the the maximum load, which is in the on the weekend in the middle of the game. So the capacity is based on what is the maximum uh, requirement, which is only on two days or three days of the, all, uh, of the three weeks. And this is quite, I mean, for, uh, uh, this is not efficient, basically, costly speaking. And uh, so the discussion was, how can we avoid this peak and to make uh, uh, the, uh, the capacity much more, I mean, uh, uh, adapted to, uh, to the average, and one of the answers was to investigate with the sport who are not that close to the village. Uh, we know by the past, by experience, it was a case in London, it was a case in Beijing, in, in Rio. Some teams for the, for, the, for the specific competition will accommodate their athletes close to the, to the, to the venue. They have, obviously, uh, each athlete has a bed, in the Olympic Village, but they don't. Uh, but he, he or she will not use it because uh, he or she will be accommodated uh, in a hotel. Because the National Olympic Committee will obviously try to give the best condition for this uh, for these athletes. So instead of being uh, um, forced with such kind of situation, they have built a. Um, a proposal to actually give incentive for the teams to be accommodated near the venue so that they will, on the other hand, they will uh, uh, save um, on the, 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 the capacity of the Olympic Village. So, this was sent to the National Olympic Committee as rowing is uh, concerned by or is, uh, is impacted by such a position. I would like just to understand who in the room has been uh, informed or is aware about such an incentive that was proposed by Paris 2024. Because it went through the National Olympic Committee. So your National Olympic Committee should have been in contact with you because uh, um, it would mean to that uh, 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 MOU had to be signed so that you can, if it's the case, the team 
will be accommodated in a hotel uh, near, the, near the venue. They will take into in charge the accommodation, they will take uh, transportation, and you will get even more uh, VAPPs, which means vehicle access uh, parking permits. You will get more uh, additional uh, team officials accreditation. They will give a lot, a lot, some incentives to ensure that some uh, of the teams will uh, um, be accommodated, not in the Olympic Village during the competition, but near the, the venue. So it's very important because uh, they went, Paris 2024 went obviously through, uh, the, uh, through the national... Okay. Uh, hello again. Uh, thank you for having me back on the topic of uh, selection racing. Always an easy one. Um, in all seriousness, um, I welcome the opportunity to speak on the most unintelligible and impenetrable topic of the conference. Clear selection clearly is more art than science. If I could bottle the formula for how to reliably win races every time, none of us would be at this conference. Puzzling over this most basic problem of competitive sports, I'm going to have to go dissecting the business of selection in two ways. One, identifying and measuring variables, and two, weighing some different methods for evaluating data. The inherent challenges and impossibility of both those goals is just delightful, isn't it? I'm so glad my second ever presentation is on such a murky yet critical topic. And that, let's dive in. Variables, okay, so let's start with variables and what coaches should anticipate or look for as they go about finding and selecting athletes. A bell curve, as you know, is a principle holding that some, but not all, measurable units like height fall along this curve. For example, most people are of average height at the top of the bell curve. The shorties get shorter and fewer in number in the left, and the genetically gifted and prone to knee injuries getting taller and fewer as the curve moves to the right. One idea that is always tossed around, at least in my country, is that with so many athletes and so many people and such a big population of the country, we should find a ton of excellent rowers. Let's just put that idea to rest first. Um, the People's Republic of China has the largest population of the IOC, countries with around 1.42 billion people. Nauru, the nation with the smallest population in the IOC, or with a population of around 10,000. It's not really relevant, but it's an interesting fact. Um, the US trails a bit with around 330 million. And New Zealand is at roughly 4.8 million. You'll pardon my sloppy math, but that would look something like this. So we're clearly missing a few variables and not just GNP, suitable bodies of water, and women's professional basketball leeching the tallest women from our feeder ranks. We know the irrelevant variables. We have a good handle on the obvious variables. So, how to select? As coaches, we go about the extremely scientific, peer-reviewed science of finding and selecting athletes. Imagine for a minute the comparison of two traits, technique and potential. This conversation is about decisions and how we make them. So let's reduce the variables and make a chart. I was a liberal arts major, it is not a fancy chart. And in this imaginary world, our up and coming athletes have technique and potential 
in inverse proportion. As one goes up, the other goes down. I get that it doesn't at all exist like this, simplifying a complicated subject, but for a minute, we'll help frame the challenges. So how do you choose? Why select one person and not another? Someone told me a funny story the other day. She trains racehorses, and we were talking about their training regime. Turns out, you can't do interval training with racehorses because they don't understand. When they are tired, they are tired. They will refuse to do anything more. Anywho, moving on. In all seriousness note, some athletes are more trainable than others. But it's not just technique and potential, of course. It's subjective metrics. How, an athlete, how is an athlete doing over time? How do they add to the team? Or race at international level? As well as the objective metrics of erg score, seat races, race results, how prone to injury, and so on. All these lay back into tie back until technique and potential. <coughs> Appearance and reality. Here, for example, is a picture of me and some teammates. I loved basketball, would have loved being better at it. But if this picture was zoomed out, it would look like this. No air. I can't jump. That pretty much takes me out of the basketball contention. And that brings us to the second discussion point. Moving past the identification and challenges of measuring variables, let's turn to the murky world of the unknown and how it affects selection. So we know selection is a puzzle with many variables that are hard to pin down and harder still to measure accurately. But the sense is that we gather information and we'll get enough pieces of the puzzle so we will be able to see what the picture forms. If we look at this, if we look at our performance in the pair and if we look at our performance here and on the erg, we should get a pretty accurate picture of the whole, the whole athlete. And that's often true. But sometimes it is not. As we all know, that a crucial need for coaches is to keep a critical eye on our suppositions and conclusions. What we think we are looking at could be incorrect. Why does this happen? How could we possibly be wrong? There's some human psychology truths behind this. Again, liberal arts major, strange graphs. Um, because our brains know we can't take all the data, our perceptions are incomplete and imprecise. So we unconsciously make decisions about what we think we are seeing, including unconsciously filling in the missing data. It makes the image coherent for us. This is sometimes referred to as gestalt. Lately, a version of this concept is called confirmation bias. We see what we want or expect to see. In any event, these unconscious habits are with us all. We instinctively connect the dots, creating a picture. That is why we make constellations in the sky. It allows us to organize the information in a way that allows us to recognize it and discuss it with each other. So looking at this, it is clearly a triangle. Even if I add a new data point, still a triangle. Bigger, but still a triangle. Here's what coaches need to say, sharp and critical. Because another data point, lurking off here in the side, makes it a square. What we haven't looked at is another piece of information that changes everything. Now the information adds up completely differently. We had it all wrong. The new information changes the picture. But wait, our minds continue to trick us and complicate our search to understand what we are seeing and how all of this fits together 
even more. Because, of course, there's more than one way to look at things. There can be several right answers. Here's a well-known example. Some see a young woman with a hat. Some see a crone with a big nose. Both are right. Here is the eye and mouth of the crone. Here is the eye of the young woman, sort of looking off to the left there. Oops. Um, and here is her chin. And this is a ribbon around her neck. And we can all see that this can easily be viewed in two different ways. Um, once we select our boat, it has to go and race. Now that we know how to select a boat, we can talk about racing. There are different purposes for races, sometimes for a medal, but also sometimes to try out new combinations or to give athletes new to the world stage more experience and for coaches to see how they handle it. The goal is not always just to win, it is also to learn. The concept holds true as we talk about racing. Keep, people can be differently right. Perspectives are different, and it's not a question of right and wrong. Each athlete, coach, and team will have their individual goals, and we all think we're right. Of course. When my nephew was a toddler, he insisted that the rule or restriction should be different for him than his brother. When asked, he would say, because now it's about me. And we're all a little like that. It is about us. But understanding the goals are flexible, fluid for athletes and coaches, which race, which seat race, collegiate, under 23 trials, World Cup, what year in the quadrennium, goals are constantly in motion for athletes and coaches, as well as the balance between learning opportunities and meddling goals. We want to make sure that we are developing athletes, as well as developing athletes that can succeed on the podium. So we have to take into account where this athlete is in her development, how young is she, what is a realistic goal for her, what are her goals for herself so she doesn't become frustrated and quit, um, and bring that all into who we send to race on a particular race. At the end of the day, data experiences observations and results can be reduced to an equation with an objective answer. Selection and with it, of course, the ultimate goal of maximizing performance requires us, the coaches, to connect the dots and make decisions based on all the information we have as best as we can interpret it. Everybody knows the ingredients of success. But as we select our boats to race, we must make sure we are aware of our own blind spots and predilections. Thank you again, and I look forward to your questions. I think that uh, Thomas will do his presentation, and then we, then we both have you on stage together, so we can uh, ask, ask a question later on. Thank you very much. Hello again. I'll just uh, continue to the slide where I was ending last time. Is it working? I'm going to tell you about how we select the uh, rowers in Denmark. It is uh, like our training. It has uh, actually changed uh, quite a lot the last four or five years. Um, before, uh, after the Olympics 2012, we changed the system. So in 2013, we got a whole new selection system. Before that, it was the coaches who decide which rower we want to invite in. So I choose from the club 
I just pick out names and say, come in, and I'll test you and see if I can use you on my team. So that's how it had worked for many, many years. Um, but it was beginning to give us trouble because times are changing, so the clubs were starting complaining, why didn't you not invite my rowers? And when we put rowers off the team and said, you are not on the national team, or they want explanations why they were not on the team. So we have to change our system so we were more secure and we could have more details on the rowers. So in 2013, um, we put up a, a new system, a procedure. We had made this test regatta in the fall during a weekend. So the rowers are using that in all other countries. We have a weekend where they have to row in scholars or in pairs. And we said that number one, two, and three were coming into the national team. And like this year, a year before the Olympics, it's only number one who will get in. Rowers who are already selected for the Olympics uh, do not need to participate in this test regatta. After the test regatta, um, the rowers have another opportunity to get into the team. They can do a, a gometer test, and we have some times. If they go under that time, they also are selected for the team. Um, then we have another test, or it's not a test, it's actually me, I have a wild card. If there's a rower I still like, I can see some opportunities, I can invite him or her into the team, even if they're not got the first two criteria to get in. Um, then we have some secondary criteria. I'll get into that later. Then we have this, we call it presence principle, that if you are selected to get on the national team, you have to move to Copenhagen, where we have our national team, where we are state. So they have to move where they live in the country. They have to go to Copenhagen so they can participate in the daily training. Um, and then we have also uh, what have the last couple of years has actually become a problem for us because we have a lot of young and good rowers. They are going to um, the United States or UK to go on university or college. So actually we have rowers that we are losing and maybe they will come back after four or five years. That's a problem for us because we don't think when they come back that they have developed or not. So we think if we can keep them home at us, we can have developed them more. And so we will actually try to keep them home, but we have to, when they come home in the spring, we have to do new selections. So I'll go on to the next slide. Oh, wrong slide. Um, we have this, you can show this is how we do the selection. We have the, in October, we have the first session, so it's people who have got into the test regatta or the gums have got, got in. We uh, gather them in October, and as you can see here, they are expected to participate in daily training when they are in. Um, then, in uh, mid-November, we do the first selection, so we quite quickly look at the rowers and do the first decision to say, no, we don't think you are ready yet to be on the national team. So already there we do the first big cut, cut it down. And then in January, it depends a little year by year where it is, but in January we will do the last cut. So we have already decided which boat we are going to, to put our energy in. So we cut it down, so we, if it's a four, we will cut it down to five or six people. And then in late March, or it could be, depend on how the, the regatta plan looked, we, we can change it a little bit. But in March, we will put the team, the crew together. So, this, so they know when they come in, they know when they can be cut off, and they know where the, when the team will be put together. Um, as you can see here, we have put some words for the club and, and the rowers, how we define the selection, and it's selection based on best possible objective and professional assessment of the rowers' technical, physical, and mental skills. 
It's what we everybody look at, nothing new. Uh, and um, for the um, physical qualification, this is what we looked at. We have this, how fast can they go on a two kilometers test in the machines? That tells us a lot because power, if you don't have power, you are not rowing fast. So 80% of the rowers who are on the national team around the world, they have a lot of power. So if you want to row fast, you need power. So that's a good way to select people. Do they have power or do they not? Of course, there's the last 20%, they can have exceptional good technique, so they can still move boat without power. Um, then we looked at their personal PR in the machines, and we also see when they row and when we test them, how often do they get close to that PR? Is it a once in a lifetime, they, they done it, and then normally they are far away from it, or are they actually capable of, of doing that time on and on again? That tells us a lot about their capability. Then we have a test week. Nothing new, we have told you about this before. Uh, we have made a little change. Um, normally we used to have one hour test. We cut that away because a lot of rowers were complaining. It's too hard. I still loved it anyway. <laughs> um, then we have these VO2 max measurements. Uh, I don't use them that much. Um, Actually, I don't care. I don't, I just, how fast do we go? And then I don't care if it's about high VO2 or it's because they have a lot of power. But we still look at it. Um, then we look at the daily results, training results. So we also can see some people have some peak days and we have people who each day make good results. So that also tells us a lot about their physics. And also training robustness, how hard can they train and how, for how long can they train hard? Some can train hard for one week and then they're tired and it's difficult to have more out of them, especially on a training camp. If you are on a three weeks training camp, it's difficult if you have a rower after one week, you can send him home. So we also looked at, can they keep on training for two or three or five or four weeks? Um, and then, the ability to adapt to exercise, also important knowledge to look at. And also body dimension, long arms, long legs, tall, small, short legs. Also give you a good idea of you can, can you use this rower for one of your boats. Um, then we have evaluation of uh, technical skills. Um, so we looked at the rower we have on the team, have they been tested before? And have they developed since last time they have been tested? And also we looked at adapting to rowing style. Um, in Denmark we don't have a rowing style, like we say, this is how it should be. So when people come from clubs, they have different rowing styles. So we looked at how fast can they change their rowing style, how fast Will they adapt to this? So we can put rowers together. Some of them will immediately begin to row like the team they sit in, and other rowers keep on rowing like the way they always have been rowing. So that's what we looked at. Then also the adaptions, the changes in the technique, are they permanent or are they only just for a short period? We have rowers, they can be, I can give them direction, I can see they change them. And then in the afternoon, it starts all over again. I, we like to see if they make changes, we'd like to see they're permanent. So that's also good information. If you want to work with them, how hard is the work? Is it impossible to, to move them or is it possible? Um, and also we have influence of teammates technique. You can put people in the boat that make the teammates better or you can put them in and they make them row worse. So that's also a very important thing to look at. It's how they affect the rest of the team. Um, and also boat feeling, ability to feel boat speed. Also important. Um, 
and can the rower transfer the technique from low rate to high rate? We have rowers, and if we do some testing in low rate, they will win the races, maybe in 24 or 2K, they will win it easily. But then if we change it to stroke rate 32, the picture will look different. So that's, it's a lot of things that we have to put together. It's, it's not that easy to, to pick out. And then we also have mental skills uh, that we looked at. This is some of the key points. Um, ability to work hard for long or short periods. It's also physical, but it's also mentally. Can they keep on have the motivation on a training camp where things get hard? Can they keep on training and training and train hard? Um, we also looked at how they are with the teammates, how they are they team. Good morning, good morning everyone. Please take your seats. Rosa, the coach there outside. The coach outside there. Okay. Okay. Okay, good morning everyone. Our next session we return on a topic that uh, raised a long discussion last year to speak about the physiological aspects of altitude training, we invite Ida Svensson, PhD in endurance training and immunity system and physiologist from the Norway Olympic Committee. So please welcome to Ida. Thank you. So my name is Ida Svensson. Um, I work as a physiologist for uh, the Norwegian Olympic Committee. So I work with rowing, but I also work with quite a few other endurance sports, uh, including cross-country skiing, triathlon, cycling, swimming. So um, I'm going to start just by giving a little bit of background and uh, explain some of the physiology behind why athletes use altitude training. I'm also going to talk a little bit about the Norwegian model uh, and how, from my perspective, uh, altitude training can be applied in rowing. So the interest for altitude training in the sporting world really started in 1968 with the Mexico Olympic Games. What happened there was that um, world and Olympic records were set in a lot of the sprints and the jumps and the throws events because of the reduced air resistance. But in the endurance events, uh, most of the favourites performed surprisingly poorly and almost all of the medals were won by high altitude natives, so people who lived and trained at altitude uh, normally. So this sparked a real interest in the sporting community, both in terms of what can you do to improve performance when competing at altitude and how can we use altitude to improve performance at sea level. So there's two different types of uh, hypoxia. The one you find when you go up a mountain, so naturally, that's hyperbaric hypoxia. So hypo means low, hyperbaric, low pressure, low oxygen. The second type uh, is normobaric hypoxia. So that's where you have a normal air pressure, and this is typically what you find in uh, altitude tents and altitude chambers. Here, you manipulate the air content, so you increase the uh, proportion of nitrogen, and you decrease the proportion of oxygen. So both give a similar uh, physiological effect, but they're kind of two slightly different things in terms of the, both the physiology and how, how they're implemented. And in Norway, we actually are not allowed to use artificial altitude. Uh, I think we are the only country in the world where this is uh, banned. So the only form of altitude training that our athletes and our coaches can use is the natural normobaric hypoxia that you find when you travel up a mountain. I know a lot of our athletes and coaches think that this is unfair and I, I kind of agree with them in a lot of ways, but I think from a completely physiological perspective, I don't see it as too much of a problem. I think that uh, a lot of the, the methods with the kind of altitude chambers and the altitude tents, I don't really believe that they have a 
substantial improvement on performance because of the hypoxic dose is perhaps a little bit too low. So I think in terms of improving sea level performance, I think actually the most effective method is still a kind of a live high model where you live at altitude and you train either at altitude or maybe at a slightly lower elevation. So in terms of altitude training models, we have there's quite a lot of different variations within these three models, but the three main ones are first live high, train high. So this is when an athlete lives at altitude and they also perform all of their training at altitude. The second model, uh, live high, train low. The athlete lives at altitude, but they typically uh, travel down to perform some of their sessions at a lower elevation or at sea level. And this is to try and preserve uh, the kind of training intensity so that you can row or cycle or run at a speed and a technique that is relevant to what you're competing at. So to kind of preserve training quality while at the same time uh, getting the physiological adaptations from living and spending a substantial proportion of the day at altitude. Uh, the third, mo third model, uh, live low, train high. This is where the athlete lives at sea level, but they perform their training or some of their training either in a hypoxic chamber or perhaps with a hypoxic mask. And this is the model that is easiest to commercialize. So we have a lot of um, companies that are offering this both in terms of gyms and uh, altitude chambers. But this is also probably the one that has the least evidence that it has a significant effect on sea level performance. Uh, so the two models in green are the ones that, both from my experience and based on what the research says, I would say you're, you can be pretty confident that these will have, if used correctly, a positive effect on haemoglobin mass and on exercise performance at sea level. Uh, the two in red, I, I personally don't think are that relevant in most cases. You can still use this. For example, we have uh, the next Winter Olympics are going to be uh, in Beijing, which is at an altitude of 1,800 meters. Obviously, in this kind of setting, where an athlete is going to be performing the most important competition of their four-year cycle at altitude, then maybe a hypoxic chamber and being able to complete some sessions and looking at kind of pacing strategies and how the athlete responds, that might be useful. But typically, I would say that the first two models are the ones that are, have the most scientific back backing and from my experience working with athletes are also the ones that the athletes respond to. <clears throat> so what happens at, when you go to altitude? Uh, if we just compare 2,000 meters, which is a kind of a pretty standard altitude that athletes uh, will use, there's approximately 20% fewer oxygen molecules in every breath you take. And this means that VO2 max is substantially reduced. You can see from uh, this graph here that the relationship between VO2 max and altitude is fairly linear. Obviously, there's, there's some variation and there's also a, quite a large inter-individual variation. So actually, more athletes who or persons who are better trained typically have a greater fall in VO2 max than untrained individuals. There's also genetic differences. This means that at 2,000 meters, there's about a 10 to 13% reduction in VO2 max. This means that if you're, for example, rowing at the same power output, you'll have a higher ventilation, you'll have about 8 to 12 beats per minute higher heart rate, and you'll have higher blood lactate concentration than if you are doing the same workout at sea level. So all this helps to stimulate uh, quite a few physiological adaptations that occur when you both live and train at altitude over a prolonged period of time. So one of the adaptations, and probably the most important in terms of improving endurance performance at sea level, is an increase in the haemoglobin mass. And this is triggered by uh, oxygen desaturation, both at rest and during exercise at altitude. And this then stimulates the, the release of uh, EPO from the kidneys. And this again stimulates the production of red blood cells in the bone marrow. And what we typically see is to see a significant increase in red blood cell mass and haemoglobin mass, an athlete would need to live at altitude for at least, we do see some increases after two weeks, but we see more substantial increases after three weeks. So typically, if the aim of the altitude training camp is to increase haemoglobin mass, we recommend a minimum of three weeks. There's also some other uh, adaptations, the ventilatory adaptations. So this is in terms of breathing rate and kind of the respiratory parameters. 
these happen quite quickly. So these can occur within the first few days at altitude, even within the first few hours. So in terms of improving performance at altitude, uh, these adaptations occur a lot more rapidly, but have limited value when you come back down to sea level. We also see an increase in the myoglobin mass in the muscles. So the hemoglobin mass in the blood, that helps your blood to take the oxygen from the lungs and transport it to your muscles. And then the myoglobin, increase in myoglobin mass, helps your muscles to actually take up that oxygen and to use it. And the final adaptation is an improvement in the buffering capacity in the blood. So this means that uh, your, your, your athlete has a, is better able to maintain a sensible kind of pH in the blood, even at high blood lactate levels. So I know that there was a talk about altitude training last year um, that Kushan Lundby was talking about. And if you look at the scientific literature around altitude training and the effect on hemoglobin mass, uh, it can be quite equivocal. Some studies say it does improve hemoglobin mass, some studies say it doesn't. I think the problem with a lot of the scientific literature is that scientists are very, um, they spend a lot of time trying to control both the conditions. So if they have a control group and an altitude group, the sea level group, the control group, will have to train exactly the same as the altitude group. And personally, I don't have any athletes that train the same altitude as they do when they're at sea level. All of our athletes will train differently at altitude than they do at sea level. So I think that's part of the explanation why when you see very well controlled scientific studies that are matched for training intensity and training volume, then maybe you don't see a significant influence on hemoglobin mass. So this is just a graph that, uh, that shows uh, hemoglobin mass change in our athletes. Uh, in the sports that I've worked with and we've, we've got measurements from. So the blue bars are the average response in the different sports and the black dots are the variation. So each black dot is an individual response. So as you can see, uh, actually rowing is over here. Uh, there's quite a large variation and it's also one of, we see there is a, a significant improvement around 3.2%, which is in line with kind of what the, a lot of the studies in the literature will say that do find a positive response. And you see that some of the sports actually have quite substantially larger improvement in hemoglobin mass. For example, triathlon uh, and swimming appear to respond really well. I think one of the explanations for the fact that maybe rowing looks like they come out a little bit worse in this graph is that rowers have a really high baseline hemoglobin mass. So this has something to do with body size. Obviously, if you're two meters tall and you're a large person, you have more blood. Uh, but I think it also has to do with the kind of training you do in there. We also see high absolute VO2 max volumes, uh, VO2 max values in rowers. And we do know that if you have a high baseline hemoglobin mass, it is more difficult to get an increase at altitude. So if you're already really well developed in this characteristic, if you have an athlete that has a baseline very high hemoglobin mass, they may not respond quite as well at altitude. Whereas if you have an athlete whose hemoglobin mass is lower, they might see a really big response at altitude. So I'm just, I think uh, there'll be some questions and answers with Johan, and uh, I'm sure he will go a little bit more into detail about how uh, the Norwegians use altitude training, but I'll just go through kind of the model that they've been using the last few years. They typically have three, uh, two to three altitude camps, each of about three weeks duration. So the first one is in the autumn uh, in Sierra Nevada. It's a live high kind of train low model. They live at 2,300 meters, and they will do some of their training uh, at 2,300 meters, maybe even some training a little bit higher, with hiking and cycling. And then all of the rowing will happen at about 900 meters uh, on the lake. So rowing is probably the one of our sports that uses uh, the live high, train low model more than any of our other sports because of the need to actually have good, uh, the facilities to be able to row on water. And it's not always possible to find a lake at 2,000 meters. Most of our other sports use a live high, train high, or train higher uh, strategy, where they do most of their training at the living elevation or even a little bit above. Uh, the second camp uh, is a winter camp. This is kind of a general endurance training camp. It's a lot of cross-country skiing, some rowing a gometer, and this is a live high, train high camp. So they both live and train at about 1,900 to 2,000 meters above sea level. 
And the final uh, one, this is you not know, all of our boats and athletes use this camp, but this is kind of a pre-competition camp. Uh, and it's, again, in Lavinia, and live high, train high. They live at 2,000 meters, and they, they row at the lake that's a, a little bit lower, but not, not very low. So this is just an example of uh, hemoglo hemoglobin mass changes for these uh, training camps in one of our athletes. So what we see, like we said, is that the camps where he has a lower hemoglobin mass when he goes into the training camp, he actually sees quite a large increase. What we see is that the summer camp uh, before the World Championships, he actually goes into the training camp with a really high baseline hemoglobin mass and therefore he doesn't really see much of a response. And likely this is because this athlete has already almost maxed out his potential for hemoglobin mass. I think when he's at about up towards 1300 grams, he probably has a limited capacity to improve this any further. And that is not to say that this camp here is not useful. There are other phys physiological adaptations that occur at altitude, and there are also other benefits of training at altitude other than the pure kind of classical physiological ones that you read about in the scientific literature. For example, I find that training at altitude is a, a really good way of kind of naturally periodizing the training so that you get a, a block of training that prioritizes aerobic capacity and maybe what you get when you're at altitude is you get a, a really good stimulus of the cardiovascular system while maybe resting the muscles a little bit because you can, you can train at a slightly lower absolute intensity and still get the same adaptation in terms of the cardiovascular system. But it is at least worth kind of thinking about, and this is obviously complicated further when you have a boat with four athletes, and maybe you have two athletes that typically respond really well and two athletes that don't feel they respond as well to altitude. It does complicate things when you're in a team sport where you have more than one athlete to, to kind of think about. So I'll talk a little bit. This is basically based on the Norwegian model, but we have a kind of a very traditional model for training altitude that all of our sports use. So we have a, a, a low intensity, high volume model. And that's pretty much the same regardless of what time of year the athletes are at altitude. Typically, if it's kind of in the competition season, they might live and train a little bit lower to try and maintain kind of the, the intensity a little bit more and use more of a live high, train low model. But typically, it's, they're always there and it's always, it's always relatively low intensity. Uh, we have a, a five zone um, kind of heart rate zone scale that we use to define training and while, when they're at altitude they're never really above zone three or zone four um, and what we've seen is that when athletes have tried to incorporate more high intensity training uh, we typically see that this has a negative effect on their hemoglobin mass response so it looks like that might actually impair the body's capacity to produce new red blood cells and i guess this seems quite logical because the body needs to have if you're constantly breaking the body down with hard, tough training sessions, then it doesn't have enough time to, well, it's spending all its energy rebuilding and recovering rather than actually making new red blood cells and increasing the volume. So we typically have no anaerobic endurance training, nothing with really high blood lactate levels. And most of our athletes do train, do, do some strength training at altitude, but typically with fewer sets or fewer reps per set and longer recoveries. And we always, I would always uh, advise my athletes to avoid new exercises that cause substantial muscle damage or muscle soreness. Because actually when you get any kind of inflammation, whether it's systemic or whether it's in the muscles, this reduces EPO and will impair the hemoglobin mass response. So in my opinion, if you're at altitude, aerobic capacity should always be priority number one. You're not at altitude to get stronger or more explosive. You're at altitude to improve aerobic capacity in VO2 max. In terms of injury and infection, uh, I would say in almost all cases, if an athlete is sick, they shouldn't be at altitude. Uh, firstly, like we talked about, inflammation reduces the red blood cell response and the hemoglobin mass response. So I, I think I have yet to see an athlete that has been sick at altitude, even just with a cold, that comes home and has a good response in hemoglobin mass. Secondly, um, being at altitude actually usually, or at least anecdotally, it will take longer for the athletes to get well. They will just be sick for longer than if you send them home and let them recover. So I would always say if an athlete is sick, they don't travel to altitude. 
if an athlete gets sick while at altitude, I would certainly isolate them from the rest of the team. Um, but I would typically also, unless it's just like a bit of a blocked nose, I would, I would also advise to send them home. And if you read the literature, there's actually uh, quite a lot of indication and, uh, that you get a greater stress hormone response at altitude. And what this means is that when you train, stress hormones are released into the bloodstream, including something called cortisol. And when you're at altitude, more cortisol is released for the same training session as at sea level. And what cortisol does is it, it reduces the immune response. So at altitude, your athletes will typically be a little bit immunosuppressed. They will have a slightly lower capacity to fight viruses and bacteria than they would at sea level. However, at altitude, your athletes are also typically exposed to fewer viruses and bacteria. You're in a much more controlled environment, at least with our teams. Our athletes only really interact with the athletes on the team and the coaches and the support staff. Uh, well, at home, they might go to the cinema, they'll sit on the train, they'll be around a lot of people coughing and who are sick. So typically, we don't actually see that our athletes are more frequently sick at altitude than they are at sea level. But if they were exposed to a virus or a bacteria, then they would be slightly less able to fight it off than what they would be at sea level. So it's important to take this into account. Uh, always make sure that you have good routines in terms of hygiene and nutrition and sleep and all the other things that we know are important for kind of avoiding illness. So sleep and recovery. Uh, we also know that typically it takes a little bit longer for athletes to recover when they're at altitude compared to at sea level. And at the same time, you get reduced sleep quality. This is quite individual, but most athletes will sleep a little bit worse at altitude than they do at home. And this is a mixture of the, the hypoxia and the fact that maybe they're in a hotel with a slightly uncomfortable bed and uncomfortable pillows, and um, it's a different place than what they're used to. But we see that this is particularly notable the first week when they're not well acclimatized to the altitude and if you're at very high elevations. So we've experimented a little bit with having athletes living, uh, particularly in cross-country skiing, we've experimented with having athletes living a lot higher than we would usually have. So they would live at maybe 3,200 meters to try and get kind of an increase in the, in the EPO response and the red blood cell response. And what we see is that the athletes, they don't sleep and they typically get sick. So even though you, you might get a, if you manage to get them through it and they stay healthy, then you probably would get a good response. We see that the risk is actually quite high with trying to do something like that. And it's important to, as coaches to take this into account. If you know that your athletes are sleeping worse than they would at home, then maybe don't have your first training session at 7 a.m. Maybe move it a little bit later so that the athletes can compensate for having been awake a few times during the night by having a bit of a lie-in. So I'd always recommend that training in meal times kind of reflect um, a, the fact that the athletes need a little bit more time in bed than they would at home. Uh, finally, nutrition and hydration. Uh, we know that it's important for athletes to have to be in energy balance when they're at altitude. I know in some sports, in cycling and a few others, that athletes from other nations use altitude as a method to lose weight because your resting metabolism is actually increased at altitude. If the aim of the camp is to get a good improvement in hemoglobin mass and, and kind of aerobic capacity, I would say that you should not be losing weight while at altitude. Uh, we often see that athletes that go down more than maybe a one or one and a half kilos, they have a very poor hemoglobin mass response. Uh, and this is, can be challenging for athletes because you have the increase in resting metabolism. You also typically maybe train more, a greater volume at altitude than you do at home and your appetite is often reduced. So eating enough can, be, can actually be quite challenging for a lot of athletes when they're at altitude, particularly if you're a place where the food is a little bit boring and there's not much variation. Uh, and it obviously also, if, in terms of lightweight rowers, this can be a problem. Uh, so I think if you're working with lightweight rowers, you should consider the timing of the altitude training camps. I think having a, an athlete at altitude when they're trying to lose weight is probably not a very good idea both because they won't get much of a response in hemoglobin, but because you're actually at a very risky part of the season in terms of illness already, and sending them to altitude is only really gonna make that worse. Iron status, a uh, really important one. If you don't have enough iron, your body can't make any new red blood cells. So uh, I, you should always have your athletes check their iron status before they go to altitude, and then 
long enough in advance that you can actually supplement if they are deficient. So it's no use finding out one week into the training camp and getting the, the answers or the results from a blood test saying that you're iron deficient. At that point, it's kind of too late. So you need to do this two to three weeks in advance. Uh, the final one is hydration. Um, there's increased fluid loss at altitude. Uh, you, there's increased urination. And there's also, because you're breathing more, you're actually losing more fluid uh, via ventilation. And in addition, it's always there's typically really low humidity in the air at altitude, which again um, causes increased fluid loss. So there's a, um, an increased need for hydration at altitude. Uh, being dehydrated, it will both increase the cortisol response and again, this will increase uh, infection risk at altitude. So this one's an important one in terms of kind of staying healthy. Uh, so a quick summary. Uh, there's quite a number of different physiological mechanisms that occur at altitude. Hemoglobin mass is probably the most important, but uh, there are other adaptations. Uh, the individual response is influenced by uh, baseline value and the hypoxic dose. So you will get a small increase, perhaps, if the athlete is there for two weeks. You will get a much larger increase if the athlete is there for three weeks. Uh, and the same, the, the higher you are, the greater the kind of stimulus for uh, EPO release. But there are also risks involved with, with living and training too high. Um, I would say that live high, train high, and live high, train low are both models that can be used uh, effectively. And I think we have a lot of experience that these two models are beneficial for performance at sea level, even if the kind of research evidence is a little bit equivocal. And even within an, without an increase in hemoglobin mass, altitude training can still have a positive effect on performance via other mechanisms. So if you have an athlete that doesn't see an improvement in hemoglobin mass, then it's important to to kind of consider that they may have had other adaptations or other training responses that, that might still be important. Thank you. Okay, to bring the discussion to the court's view, we invite two very experienced coaches to join Ida for the next panel. Johan Flodin, successful coach from Sweden, and Mr. <laughs> Jürgen Groblen from, from Sweden, and now the head coach for Norway. And uh, Jürgen Groblen, who over the last decades has masterminded the British rowing and have a book on Amazon, so you can find everything. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, and thank you very much for your presentation. I think I might come round the other side, so I'm not quite near the. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not behind the okay, so um, we've heard a little bit about Johan, how you use altitude training. So can you just um, take us through a little bit more detail in terms of? Uh, you, you, you mentioned the timings, but can you just talk about sort of when in the season you go? I mean, is it right at the beginning of the autumn season? Is it a bit later? Uh, how long do you stay up there? And uh, uh, so let's start with that, and then we can talk about the type of training you do up there. Please. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> we start our altitude year with uh, uh, actually a common camp with together with triathlon swimming and, and uh, cycling and some race walkers uh, up in Sierra Nevada. And we do that, usually we do that uh, somewhere October, November, a little bit different from each year. And, uh, and then we have a cross-country ski camp in Livigno in uh, the beginning of, uh, in the middle of April, uh, January to the beginning of February. And then we send up uh, the crews that uh, has highest belief on altitude training to Livigno again uh, and prior to the World Championships. And we have the idea that we're coming down 24 days before the f most important race of the championship. Okay, so when you say 24 days, you mean the final? Uh, usually, for Olaf, it has been the final. But in this year, he's uh, in the quad, and we think that uh, he, the, the road to final is not that easy as it was in 2004. So I think that this year we will uh, actually aiming for the beginning of the regatta, 24th of July. Okay. And we, we, we're staying for 
somewhere between 18 and 21 days at each time. Okay, thank you. And how many years have you been using altitude training for? Uh, I used it when I was coaching Frida before, so I think I've been using altitude training for about 10 years. And uh, uh, that then, in the beginning, actually, we could hang on to the Norwegian team. So, uh, so Olaf has used altitude training, I think, since, and Norway has used it for 40 years, I think, uh, on, especially on ski camps. And they were in St. Moritz uh, before. So, so it's, it's a long tradition with using altitude training. And Olaf has done it. He needs to do it. He's one of the great responders as well. Okay, thank you. Um, Jürgen, <clears throat> so I'll start with how many years have you been taking uh, rowers up to altitude? Okay, and uh, that would say something about my age, if you ask me. <laughs> um, I know uh, this high altitude, I've been involved as a student in preparation of the 68 Olympics in Mexico. So in that time, I think, yeah, we experiment okay, how can we adapt to high altitude as a student? We have been running around with normal masks and putting a tube on to have, you know, less oxygen. That was very demanding on the body, very strong. But then I think since I'm a coach, um, and that was an, started in 1970, uh, I'm going to high altitude. I think I've been more than 100 um, camps excludes the uh, time we spent also an experiment with the chamber. So I think as a, yeah, normally all my life as a coach I've been to high altitude. Okay, so um, Johan explains how and when he uses altitude training. So how do you use it with your athletes? I think we have a, more or less a similar model. We go three times in high altitude. We go in November, December, depends our, on our regatta calendar in Britain, especially with the foreset. Um, so we're adapting a little bit to that. Then we go again in January. Both camps are cross camps, so it's not rowing, because you can't uh, row in the winter. <laughs> and then we have in the final preparation before the World Championships, Olympic Games, a similar uh, high altitude camp. We prefer, or we have always sleep high, train high. So I think we've been always in combination with, with the venue where we train. We tried different things, or I've been, we tried in the past, but I think there was always a, maybe the most efficient model, I think. Okay, and uh, typically are you up at altitude about three weeks as well each time? I think we start, I think uh, yeah, in the old days we started with three weeks, of course then there's a financial thing as well, so we've been down to 16 days, and I think doing that more often or now three times, uh, my experience was that is uh, yeah, managed my expectation on all the physiology effects as we just have seen from the Norwegians. And I know that on occasions the two of you have crossed or been at um, Sierra Nevada at the same time. And uh, Johan, you're training, you're living high, training low. And Jürgen, you're training high, living high. So can you just describe what sort of training that you would typically do in that period? Uh, for us, uh, it's uh, also a, a, a g kind of a general camp, but we also choose to row at least six uh, mornings every week. So we're going down for uh, three or four hours, uh, 2,000 meter, and how I usually do a big volume of long slow distance. We can do 30 kilometers on the lake in the morning and then in the afternoon we can have a weight session or a cross, cross training session with, uh, with uh, cycling and running and walking in the mountains or weight training. So uh, that's a choice, choice that we have uh, done because it also comes in a period when it starts to get really hard to row in Norway so we want to keep, it's important to us to keep that quality. 
Yeah, I, I think, uh, especially in Sierra Nevada, yeah, there's a chance to roll, but I think with a big team like we are, it's a lot more difficult, uh, big logistics, getting all the boats up there, get them boating, and so far we prefer to use the ergos uh, in where we're living. We do weight training, do other activities like yeah, playing football or things like that, so be more uh, athletic. Okay, and <clears throat> I think um, for both of you, do, how do you prepare your athletes before you actually go up to altitude? So do you have anything that you do in the weeks, days leading into an altitude camp, or do you just go up there and you're there? Uh, for us, uh, it, we, we usually start up, uh, when, when we know that we're going to an altitude camp, we start to work uh, more intense with Ida. So we, have, uh, we actually do measurements on uh, hemoglobin volume, or hemoglobin mass. We also do uh, a pre-altitude medical uh, investigation to see if people are prepared, if, if their immune system, is their iron depots uh, filled up. And we also like to have uh, what we call an easy enter and an easy exit. So actually we train uh, a little bit less intense training uh, the last 48 hours before we leave and the last first three days when we come up and the same when we exit. So it's, uh, we feel that those around the travel is, is, are really demanding. Uh, Period, because you want to come up fresh, and you want to leave somewhat fresh. So, so uh, yeah, we have a, we have a, a lot of preparation, and we, as uh, Ida said, we're not uh, if ta if somebody is ill, we're not sending them, and we're very also very quick on sending people home if uh, if they have a some kind of infection. We also stimulate people to go to the dentist before, because if you have a bad tooth, that can also actually uh, make the response worse. Okay. And Jürgen? I think uh, similar. Uh, I think the message is really crystal clear. Uh, if you uh, take an unfit athlete in high altitude and you think there's a fast truck to make him fit, it will not work. There will definitely be uh, a negative effect. So and so far, yeah, of course our athletes will be also checked they are healthy, that's why I think also our preparation is we have uh, the first eight weeks home training, so they are more or less fit when they go up. Uh, and I think then, yeah, a couple of days before we go, we have a little bit less uh, training, so they recover, so we can really use uh, high altitude training right from the beginning. We have also in the program yeah, the first three days as an adaptation time uh, where we're holding the uh, training a little bit lower, but then I think uh, we have the full training. Okay, and uh, do you modify, I mean you, you've talked about, uh, maybe this is also a question for you Ida, you've talked about the individual responses being quite different. So, um, how, does that, um, how does that look when you have an athlete that's never been to altitude as opposed to someone that has been to altitude? I think that is, that is a really important question because... ...meet athletes. And most of you are here today, I know some of you are doing development coaching. Uh, at, um, at, a, at a local level, but some of you are doing elite development and, and elite coaching. Elite athletes are amongst the most vulnerable to harassment and abuse, which is, is an amazing fact, true. Um, children are more vulnerable than adults, particularly girl children. That would be inside and outside of sport. Um, Para-athletes are more vulnerable than non-para-athletes because of a number of issues associated with, associated with getting them to practice, how they handle practice, uh, what equipment they need, what extra supports they may need, medical uh, help, 
and so on. So it's more complex for them, and there are more vulnerabilities associated with that. Um, athletes who are lesbian, gay, bisexual, or trans, so LGBT athletes, um, they're extra vulnerable as well, and there's uh, some studies that support what that looks like. I'm going to skip the indigenous for the moment. Um, and then the last line there is any, any athletes who come to you, or any participants in sport actually, who come to you who have extra vulnerabilities, uh, who come because they're economically disadvantaged, or they come speaking a language differently than the one you're coaching in, or who come to you from a, a remote place in your country and are not used to um, kind of urban environments and big clubs and things like that. Those are all vulnerabilities that athletes port with them. Why this slide is so important is not only to acknowledge these differences and to help those athletes feel safe and welcome in the sport, but also there are cross vulnerabilities. So if you have a para-athlete who's female and who's at the elite level, you have a whack of vulnerabilities there. So that athlete is going to need a lot of your care and attention to make sure that they are safe and have a good chance to perform. So that's our responsi responsibility. Um, the uniqueness of sport, I'll just highlight a couple. Oh, by the way, these are all up on the FISA website. So if you go out of the FISA, FISA website, look at safeguarding, you'll find these slides. Um, thank you to Lucy Trochet who put that up. Lucy, she was here a minute ago. There she is. Okay, just a couple of things here um, that's uh, about sport and uniqueness. I have to keep turning around because I can't quite see that. I'm a woman of a certain age. Um, our progress through sport is based on achievement, and you've heard lots of discussion about how that achievement is measured. The intense involvement of a coach in an, in an athlete's life is unique to sport. So when I talked about we have abuse and harassment outside and inside of sport, these are the unique parts inside of sport where we need to, uh, need to pay attention. The coach's authority is largely unquestioned, um, particularly the higher level coaches and particularly the coaches who are award, award winning, they escape any scrutiny in terms of um, any of their, their, maybe their unusual behaviors or their below the radar behaviors that are negative. Uh, we don't tend to pay attention to them and we don't ask. So I'm really thrilled with all the discussion about coaching teams and coaching teams meeting and so on because that's one of the best ways of, um, of having scrutiny on all coaches. Um, and um, I'll just go to the, uh, I think the middle one there, persons in positions of authority. We have a lot of, uh, we have a lot of peer, peer-to-peer -peer relationships, but we also have in sport a lot of those in authority over others in sport. Um, these people in positions of authority have power over the others, or they may be, uh, there may be a relationship of trust, and that trust should not have obviously be broken. Um, where you have relationships yet like that, you cannot have consensual sex. You cannot consent when one has power over. So in my country, those kind of relationships are not lawful, because the consent is a coerced consent. In your country, you may have different rules and regulations, but it's worth thinking about position of authority over someone else and what that means in terms of um, any kind of relationships and behaviors and so on. Okay, sport is unique. Now, some of the definitions you'll see, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time here. Um, uh, you'll see the word violence, and we use the UN definition of violence in all its, uh, all its forms. It comes from the conventions of the rights of the child. Uh, we use gender-based violence, and that is violence based on uh, one's gender or the perception that others have of your gender. Um, and uh, we know that in the harassment and abuse literature, the violence literature, more, feel, more females are, um, are victims of this than males. That's not to, to say that males don't, if they are in the sphere of victims, that they aren't equally damaged. Uh, of course they are but more females than males. So gender-based violence also has a gendered lens that we must use. And the whole notion of unwelcome or unwanted attention. So if an athlete is telling you that they don't want you touching them on the back end, stop. You shouldn't be doing that anyway. 
uh, you should probably be asking their permission to touch them in any case. Is it okay if I correct your knee position here on the slide? Right, when they're on the erg or something like that. But touching is a really important part. Um, the athlete may not want the kind of attention um, another person is giving them in terms of uh, a potential relationship. They may not want that. And if they don't want it, it should stop. Okay, unwanted behavior. And you'll see these other terms as well, safeguarding, child protection, abuse, harm. Um, I've put this up, it's very complex, but I'm, I'm gonna walk through it um, and I'm gonna do it without a mic, okay? So on this side is the cultural context. So this is all of the power differentials in sport. So we have differentials based on sex. We have differential power based on age. Those who are older have more power than those who are younger. We have uh, power differential based on um, uh, ethnicity. Uh, you have a dominant ethnicity in, in an area and then there are marginal ethnicities. So we have all these power differentials that go on. As soon as you have difference, you have power differentials. That, that, that doesn't mean they're negative, but it means when it comes into sport, we have to somehow equalize that out so that everybody who comes from any of those differences gets equal treatment. The middle one is about the abuse dynamic. So if you come from difference and it's taken advantage of by someone who has sexual motives, for example, the portal in is through the psychological harassment or psychological abuse. So that's where it starts and that's where we as coaches can have a tremendous impact. When you see the beginnings of that, that psychological harassment or that unfair treatment that's going on in relation to a coach and an athlete or another coach and yourself or a parent and a coach, call it as poor behavior as marginal behavior, as gray zone behavior. Name it and bring them back into the sphere of good behavior, right? It starts right there with that psychological. Then it proceeds down into the different kinds of abuse that we experience and the mechanisms. And so the ways in which abuse happen are uh, partly by contact. Um, there is, uh, is non-contact. Um, you're all aware that we have an internet that has, uh, uh, you know, athletes can be reached in lots of ways. Um, and that there are some of those ways that are absolutely inappropriate for coaches and athletes, right? There are some things that you do not, you do not communicate. Um, I'm speaking of pornography, I'm speaking of, you know, the messages at midnight, you know, between a coach and an athlete that are inappropriate. Those kinds of things have to be off the board. No, it's non-contact, but it is harassment. Um, negligence, this is one where we can hurt people by things we do, but we can also hurt people by paying no attention to them, by neglecting them. By, um, for example, I, I used the example yesterday of uh, I had a 19K row, which was a qualifying row to make the Olympic team. It was on the Hillsborough River. It was 35 degrees. It was a 19K time trial with a turnaround at the end, and we had no water. And we weren't allowed to take water. We didn't take water in those days. So that would be neglect. And these days, you would see that as neglect. Okay, and then some, um, some indicators at the other end. So this slide is up on, it's part, part of the IOC consensus statement document that uh, FISA uses as well. It's dated uh, 2016 and it's pretty comprehensive. Okay, a note on mal maltreatment, just the three words at the bottom that are important. In, in my world of harassment and abuse or violence uh, in sport, it, it keys in on relationship. It's about the interrelationship between you as an individual and every other person you touch in sport. And when those relationships are good, which they are 99% of the time, we have wonderful experiences in sport. But when that relationship shower, showers, for whatever reason, that's when we have the problems. All right, but it is all about relationships. So I'm, I'm very encouraged by the discussions this morning about how you build relationships. Um, with colleagues and with uh, athletes, and there was some mention of parents. I think those are very, very positive. Um, 
The second is, when something does go wrong, it is an integrity failure. So you have a code of ethics. FISA has a code of ethics. You may not yet have a code of ethics in your country. Some of you do, some of you don't. Those codes of ethics are really important for setting the bar for what is considered as appropriate behavior and what we are all held against, measured against. Okay, and to fail is an integrity failure, not only of the individual, but of the sport. And the third one there is the intent of the person is irrelevant. So it doesn't matter whether you intend to harm or your behavior does harm them, even though you didn't intend it, you meant it as a joke or you were insensitive or something. Harm is harm, so it's, your intent is irrelevant on whether there is, there is an issue. Okay, so I'm going to go right to what do the facts look like. So these are the parts that make us sit up. The first one is uh, one from the Canadian study that was done in 1996. Uh, you may say well, that's old and it's Canadian. The study has been replicated in a number of countries around the world. 22.8% of Canada's high performance and recently retired high performance athletes in sport had had sex with a person in a position of authority. In sport. It's more than one in five had had sex with somebody in authority. And many of them, at th in those days, thought that that was okay and that was appropriate. Now we would go, oh, that's a terrible number. And it is. And it's, the number is still there. We're still looking at studies where that number comes out. Two to eight percent of children are sexually abused in sport. So when I said rowing uh, recruits a little later, we're probably a little bit okay on that one. Children being anyone under 18. Now we have Youth Olympic Games and we have uh, age categories in sports, so we're not completely out of the woods there. The one on the far right is 81% of 10,000 participants experienced homophobia in sport. So that is discrimination on the basis of one's sexual orientation. So if we're, we're talking about a sport that is open and welcome to all, then a certain proportion of the population has that kind of characteristic and they belong in our sport as well. So how do we account for that kind of, that kind of number? So we have to be a little bit um, open to that. Um, remember I talked about um, psychological abuse as being the portal in? The recent work by, uh, by Kerr has shown, uh, shown that 65 to 85% of high performance athletes, again, this one is a Canadian study, 65 to 85% have experienced psychologically abusive uh, coaching practices. So we're not talking about one or two coaches who have poor, poor behaviors. We're talking about a cross sport. We're talking about a, a problem for coaches. And the final one, because there's so little literature, just points out that uh, persons with disabilities are four times more vulnerable than those without disabilities. So in para rowing, we have a lot of work. Uh, I'm also mindful that we have a whole uh, area of sport called Special Olympics that, to my knowledge, has no, no research on this. And I suspect there's some vulnerability there. Okay, a couple of other pieces of data. I'm not going to speak about them all. Most of the perpetrators are male. Not all, but most of the perpetrators are male. And they're not, they're not uh, dirty old men. They're males between 16 and 50. Uh, no, between uh, 31 and 50 years in one of them and 16 to 63 years in another. So the males come in all varieties, all ages, but it's primarily males who are um, the aggressors here. Um, and we have a new body of research you know, opening up about peer abuse. So you have uh, initiations and hazing ceremonies uh, in sport. Those are considered abusive. Um, and you have peer-to-peer -peer abuse where there's power over older athletes to younger athletes perhaps, or males to females. So that's an area that we're spending some time in as well. Okay, I'm gonna skip that one. On this one, um, this is the experience of athletes. These are um, 1,799 athletes in Germany. And if the chart were all gray, we'd be happy. So any of the colorful parts are where there are uh, issues of harassment and abuse, violence against athletes. The more, the more severe, the more orange. 
So on the top level, you see female and male, and you can see that uh, females have a harder time than males because there's, there's more, uh, more gray for the male. A, a male uh, athlete in sport is actually somewhat safer. Uh, you have migrant and non-migrant um, uh, participants in sport. It's easier, it's easier for those without a migration background. And we have people moving about the world now in sport and in rowing to some degree, so this is something to be mindful of. Um, the third one there is about heterosexual orientation and, uh, and non-heterosexual orientation. And if you're heterosexual and you have an easier time in sport, simple. Um, and the final one is non-para Olympic and Paralympic. Now remember this was with the elite athletes in Germany. So the non-para athletes have more gray, so they have an easier time than the para athletes. So just in pairings, it shows a little bit the vulnerability. And I'm gonna show this a slightly different way. This is study from uh, 4,000 athletes from Belgium. Psychological abuse, so the, the, the first column you see total sample, 26% of athletes experience psychological abuse of a moderate to severe nature in 4,000 athletes across all sports. These were athletes, not necessarily elite athletes. 10% um, experience physical abuse and 12.8% experience sexual abuse of a moderate to severe nature. And then when you cross the circles, you can see how one's character of ethnicity means that you're more vulnerable than on average LGP, LGBT are more uh, vulnerable than, um, than average. Elite athletes, these are your straightforward elite athletes who many of you work with. Psychological abuse, 26% on average, they experience 42%. That's two out of every five of our athletes at the elite level experience some sort of psychological abuse that's moderate to severe. And we're coaching them. We should be coaching them with this in mind that we're trying to ameliorate things that maybe none of our, we're not causing it perhaps, but it certainly is in our sphere of influence to ameliorate. Physical abuse, 10% on average, 23.2% for elite athletes. Sexual abuse, 12.8%, 25.9%. So when I talked about the early study that, uh, that I had generated, the number is not going down. That's, that's, that's one in four. My study had about one in five. This one has one in four. And you can see with para-athletes on the side, the numbers are even greater. So this is a really instructive slide for how we make sport open and welcoming for all. Okay, I'm gonna skip that. I'm gonna, nah, I should talk about this. Yeah, I should talk about this. This is the stage of imminent achievement. Um, so, um, when you go up, up the slide, it has novice competitive, elite development, and elite. Now, many of you are working with elite development and elite. So that's called sport age. A novice has a similar experience whether they're 18 or 27 when they come into the sport of rowing. They're both novice and they both feel the uncertainties. At the elite development and elite, we can see where they're going. Along the uh, bottom is chronological age. Um, and so the, the peak risk of sexual abuse is that, that um, silo there when puberty, as part of chronological age, when puberty hits and it crosses with elite development and the elite athlete. So elite development is when the athletes have an awful lot to lose. They're on the path to success. They can see their dreams in front of them. They're on that road to the games, and then they experience sexual abuse, and they usually go right by it. They, it's called, what I call it a choice of one. They make the only choice that's available, which is they have to stay on the path, or they have to give up their Olympic dream. So this slide is quite instructive when we talk about rowing and what is the age uh, at which we recruit athletes, and what are they bringing in with them in terms of their vulnerabilities and what should we be mindful of uh, when we're coaching. So, and that slide usually resonates quite well. Okay, 
recent or historic abuse, we have a number of athletes, former athletes, who are now talking about their stories. And I just want to say that those stories are important to listen to. They tell us about the lifelong impact of abuse. Um, but they also tell us that um, uh, when these cases come forward or these com complaints come forward late, sometimes they come forward because the abuser or the abusers are still at work. So those people who are disclosing late are actually doing our sport a great service by talking about it now and helping us to prevent continuing abuse. Where are we now? Uh, we have huge gaps in the research still. We have global gaps. We know a lot about some parts of Africa, a lot about Europe, a little bit about Asia, a lot about Australia. We know absolutely nothing about New Zealand, which astounds me. We know a lot about uh, the US and Canada, but n almost nothing about uh, South America. So we have gaps around the world in terms of the research that need to be filled in. Um, we have international leadership emerging, and, um, and I, I give a shout out actually to the International Equestrian Federation, International Tennis, International Ski, and to FISA. And now FIFA is, FIFA is coming off the block as well. So there are some big international federations who are doing some really good work here. Um, and it's the ability to work across sports actually that's making that work. Um, and we have projects and programs. So there are lots of things out there that help us know what to do. F uh, FISA is not alone in trying to solve this problem. There are lots of people outside of sport, lots of people inside of sport who have resources uh, to, to, uh, to give us. The IOC has done quite a lot of work, so there's lots of resource there. Uh, and I point you to the IOC um, toolkit, um, which is uh, you know, really instrumental. The UN, and particularly UNICEF, has been a front and center in some of this work. And there are a number of other organizations um, that are, are really active in the area. Some of them doing research, some of them doing programs. One particular one in, um, uh, in it's called the Erasmus Project, is talking about the voice of athletes and bringing the voice of those athletes with experience to the table. So partly to keep them alive and partly to help bring their influence back into sport. And finally, in summary, if you need uh, research, there are those who are available to do it. Uh, there are a few resources, but there are a lot of people who know how to do research and are willing to help you. Uh, there are organizations. There are organizations who have some data, most do not, and as I said, most in rowing, we have virtually no data that points specifically to our sport and things we could be doing. Um, we have a need for proactive and preventative work, and that's partly why I'm thrilled to be here, is that this is proactive and preventative work. Um, by being aware of this issue and a FISA's commitment to this, we hopefully will teach you more and more and empower you to do better and better work at what you do. Um, you as coaches, but you as instrumental in training other coaches, and you as instrumental in making FISA work as a, as a good and healthy organization for athletes. So I will stop there. Thanks very much. Okay, so Sandy will be here for the next couple of days, so um, if you have any questions, um, please do go and uh, talk to her because she's very knowledgeable in the area. And the reason this is important to us as coaches is because, um, as Sandy said, we have a big uh, role to play in ensuring that our sport is safe. And it's also, uh, we as coaches need to make sure we protect ourselves and protect the other athletes that are in our environment. And so uh, the transformational coaching that Jean was talking about uh, links very well into this subject as well about how do we actually create the best environment that we can to keep our athletes and ourselves and other people in our sport uh, safe. So FISA have uh, launched um, the safeguarding policy. It's on our website. Um, you should all have, have seen it. If you haven't, please look. There's one of these cards on each of the tables. Uh, please pass it around um, and uh, some lucky person can take it with them. This year we have had safeguarding officers at each of our events. 
and we are now expecting each of our events to have a safeguarding officer appointed by the venue. So if the event is in, in London, then London will appoint a safeguarding officer. Um, we are, we have got, uh, this year also, we are going to be, uh, we've realized through some of our delivery to, on our, to our coaches that they are extremely isolated. So not only is the research patchy around the world, but also some of the policies and the people in place in order to look at safeguarding are also uh, not, not there. And so uh, FISA on, at the NF conference tomorrow will be having a session about this uh, because it's all very well you as a coach creating a safe environment and understanding the policies, but you need to know who it is above you or alongside you that can actually be taking this subject forward. And later, uh, early next year, uh, we will be educating, uh, making sure our council and our executive members are also educated uh, and, and making sure that there are safeguarding officers again next year at all our events. So um, thank you, Sandy, for your presentation. And it's why it's so important to all of us as coaches and that why we can make a big difference uh, to the people that take part in our sport. So thank you very much. Uh, <coughs> Um, so it's now lunchtime and we start again at uh, 1, 1.45. So please, can you come back in so I don't have to do my sheepdog thing and round you up? Okay, thank you.